Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started now. We appreciate, uh, as usual, your coming out this evening to spend some time with us in our House Committee on Finance. Um, we've got a packed house tonight, but we have a method to the madness of trying to, uh, to get through this. So if everybody will take a seat, I think we'll get started. The, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is we don't have to have a roll call quorum because uh, I see that we do have the correct number of members, so we do have a quorum in order to do our business. The next thing to do before I forget is that we've got just one bill tonight, and that's uh, House Bill 7593 uh, by Vice Chair Slater. So what we'll do is we will hold that for further study, which, which is a way to get all bills into play in the House of Representatives. So if there has to be a change or if something happens, uh, it'll come back out as a, a substitute A. But we need to get this bill uh, into play with our help for further study. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. They will hold House Bill 7593 for further study. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed to holding it in uh, further study? Okay, great. So we're not holding that into further study. Before we get started, uh, I always go over about three or four minutes worth of how we operate uh, in the Committee on Finance here. And one of them is that we, we go in three sections. First, uh, our staff, the fiscal staff, Sharon and her crew, will give us an overview of whatever the bill or the governor's budget, whatever part we're working tonight. And that's to help refresh, uh, refresh us on where we are with particular issues. When she and her staff finish, the members of this committee will have an opportunity to ask questions if they want to. After that is over, we will then have a member of the administration, because part of this is the governor's budget, will come up, and if Sharon did not or could not uh, answer some questions that were asked, maybe, the administration has a chance to uh, tell us about their proposal and perhaps answer those questions. After that, which is most important, then the bill will be introduced. And the third leg is yourselves. You can look to your left and your right, as I say every time we have one of these meetings. We've got a packed room, which is a good thing because we want to hear from you. But uh, please respect your colleagues, your left and your right. And tonight we are going to use a timer. We don't normally do it all of the time. But we have a big room, we do that. So we're going to go with three minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Three minutes, trois minutes. Uh, when uh, at, at the end of that point, you'll hear a little signal, and that just means please wind down. We take a lot of information uh, through uh, written testimony, which is great. Uh, and we do read it, and it comes to us. This is your chance to tell us why you support something or why you don't. We understand all of the bills that we get, so it's just I support this bill or I do not support this bill. And you have three minutes to do that, and then we move on to the next, so that everybody you see can get a chance to uh, make sure that they, they are heard tonight. So that's the way we will run it. I will do my best to keep uh, our members here focused on questions or any discussions on the topics that are presented, not on topics that are not presented. And so you might see me uh, say, let's stay focused, and that's just to make sure that we have the information that we're going to need uh, as a finance committee to make these decisions. So uh, if I didn't leave anything out, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start with Sharon. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, as you mentioned, you've got Article 11 of the Governor's Budget, uh, Adult Use Marijuana Program on your agenda, as well as a related uh, bill uh, sponsored by Rep Slater on a very similar topic. So we'll start with our usual background and information explaining the budget article, and we'll wrap up with some side-by-side um, -side comparisons on some major issues before Representative Slater gets a chance to um, describe his bill. So Article 11, uh, in summary, establishes a 21 uh, and older adult use marijuana program. It's got a, a tax uh, system of excise and sales tax for related uh, products. It addresses such things as uh, operating a vehicle under the influence, workplace provisions, um, uh, prohibited populations, et cetera. Uh, we uh, show here for you a, a kind of a map of the United States on, on where uh, states are in their different adoption of uh, marijuana pr programs from 
either uh, no program at all to uh, both adult and uh, medical. This has changed a little bit from last year's uh, um, presentation. Uh, there's a couple more states with some texture or color on it, um, but not many changes since last year. Um, it, we've got a summary here again, very similar to what we presented to you last year, uh, this in chronological order on some of the major uh, uh, milestones in other state activity with the most recent uh, things happening, New York, Connecticut, um, uh, New Mexico, Virginia. In terms of Rhode Island's uh, cannabis programs, uh, began, uh, it, it, the medical marijuana program began in 2005. You've adopted a number of changes summarized here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, but just a quick summary here for you uh, on um, some high-level items. The Office of Cannabis Regulation currently in DBR. Uh, it was established as a separate entity a couple of years ago, but really DBR has since 2016 regulated mar uh, medical marijuana and hemp, oversees the authorized retailers, growers, plant tags, and it also sets the standards for industries participating, and uh, there's a, a regulatory function between DOH and DBR in terms of laboratories. Um, Article 11 codifies that role for the Office of Cannabis Regulation. Um, there's, uh, it includes uh, information on how uh, coordination and regulation and a, a bunch of other things would happen. Um, so right now, it looks like this, uh, with the health department in charge of patients, authorized purchasers and testing labs and business regulation. Um, in charge of everything else. The proposed hierarchy, again, very similar to last year's, no change to last year's proposal um, from a hierarchy perspective. Um, you have a role now, at least uh, Department of Revenue, Public Safety, and some human service agencies on some additional items, uh, taxation enforcement and substance abuse prevention and treatment. Um, uh, Article 11 proposes powers for the Office of uh, Cannabis Regulation by statute, giving some broad authority uh, for some things and then making other things a subject to their discretion and allowing for a number of things to be defined by regulation. Uh, so it, it can set non-retail license types. Um, it's allowed to limit the number of industries. It can set license application windows, uh, a host of related items summarized here for you. Um, uh, the article envisions there would be a total of up to 84 licensed retailers uh, through fiscal 2024. Um, when you account for the nine existing uh, allowances for um, compassion centers, that's up to 72 new retail licenses. Um, with 15 of them uh, minimum for minority business enterprises. After 2024, it will be subject to the office's discretion on additional ones. Uh, these licenses would be issued in uh, increments of up to 25 over three application cycles, each cycle having a 20% minority business set aside um, in that cycle. Um, compassion centers uh, would become hybrid licenses uh, subject to applications and fees. Uh, you, you know there's currently three compassion centers operational. The six were authorized a couple years ago. Five have finally been selected. None yet are operational. Uh, those may transition to for-profit in accordance with the Office of Cannabis Regulation guidance uh, based on whether they demonstrate there's no adverse impact to the medical program. Uh, licensed cultivators, there would be an open application after the 1st of July. Um, medical cultivators could get a hybrid license. Um, the revenue assumptions are assume only the existing cultivators are, are initially licensed. Our current information is there are about 68 operational cultivators now. Um, cannabis testing labs, um, right now there's a, a third party la lab uh, licensed by DOH in coordination with DBR to test and collect. Um, Article 11 adds much more prescriptive uh, standards uh, for proficiency, quality control. Uh, there could be additional licenses, laboratory licenses pursuant to these standards. Uh, the office would be able to issue those things. 
It also, there's other supporting activities for which the office could issue licenses, such as a processor, deliver, craft cultivation, any number of things could be envisioned and then issued. Um, for these in the first licensing period, half of them will be set aside to minority businesses. Again, all of this at the discretion of the Office of Cannabis Regulation. There's also some reporting requirements uh, over a number of years. Uh, first, there's a, it, the article creates a 15-member reinvestment task force. Uh, the members noted here, um, ex officio uh, government uh, um, employees as, as well as some other folks. They would um, convene and advise a cannabis regulation and the Office of Management and Budget regarding long-term investment of proceeds. Also, a number of uh, specific reports would be required over the next couple of years, assessing minority business enterprise participation, whether or not there's been an impact on the medical industry and, and, and any of those impacts, um, uh, assessing market demand, uh, a number of items essentially left for future reporting and um, to be dealt with later. The article extends uh, the office's regulation and authority to new products for adult use, so transportation, delivery, seizure, destruction, security requirements of the facilities, uh, similar to um, the medical marijuana program, marketing and advertising practices. Um, it expressly prohibits consumption in public, uh, consumption of any kind. Um, it also has different limits based on one's residence, so uh, homeowners would not be limited, but renters would have uh, limitations based on the ownership, um, and then public housing and affordable housing would be uh, consistent with federal smoke-free regulation standards. An, uh, uh, an aspect that's new to the governor's recommenda recommendation this year compared to last year, because thus far most of them have been very similar to last year or identical, is a, a, a section on expungement. So Article 11 would make um, uh, expungement free for all convictions of these de decriminalized activities. Um, and it would be an automatic expungement schedule uh, carried out uh, at different dates enumerated in the article, depending on the conviction date, with um, the newest convictions expunged first and then all the way back um, in three stages. Um, we would note also that to the extent uh, licensing uh, effects is affected in any way by expungements not carried out, the licensing is envisioned to happen before the expungement period is over. So the automatic expungements may not be done um, before licensing happens. Um, so on the tax side, um, the article it, it establishes the taxation structure. It would have a retail excise uh, tax rate of 10%, so that's price-based. And then there would be a cultivation excise tax by weight. Uh, that has been, just as last year, estimated to be worth approximately 3% on the price. So it's, it's been um, estimated to be essentially effective to a 3% sales tax rate. This also, uh, as it did in last year's proposal, would apply to the medical side. Um, and that would increase the total medical effective tax rate from 11% to 14%, and uh, everything would be subject to the state sales tax. So in summary, under current law, medical uh, marijuana is subject to the state sales tax, and then that gross uh, surcharge of 4% for a total effective rate of 11%. Under the governor's Article 11, that 11% would move to 14, and then the newly authorized uh, adult use program would be equivalent to about 20%. Um, looking at what other states in the region do, you can see that uh, there's a pretty wide variety depending on the product, and then a combination of excise sales and local tax. You can see that New York even does a concentration, a potency-based tax. So. There are a variety of different ways that states have approached taxation. On the local side, uh, Article 11 um, says that the municipalities can't uh, ban activities by regular businesses, um, and they must, by referendum, uh, 
ban a, a, a related industry, but it would have to be done by November uh, 8th, 2022, and then the applicable ordinance is in place a few months later. Um, they cannot prohibit existing medical operations or the related transportation. They may allow for some one-time impact fees if they can prove that they are the actual costs. Just like last year, all of the taxes and fees would go into a trust fund, and um, over half of which would go into the general fund, 15% to the locals, and about 25% would be spent on the regulatory side of things. What are the estimates that feed into these uh, items? So for the first year, um, the budget estimates show some upfront costs that really end up netting the state almost nothing after the, it, it comes out to about 1.2 million. There's probably some other fee items uh, related that, that bring this down to close to zero. Uh, and in the out years, the average out year impacts about 18 million. Um, the scenario provided to us is that in fiscal 24, it's estimated to be about 17 million um, because by then the, the revenues are, um, the, the one-time expenses are gone and, and the market is, is operational for longer. Regulatory expenses are estimated to occur not just in the Office of Cannabis Regulation in the Department of Business Regulation, but also Department of Revenue, Public Safety, Health Department, and then the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, as well as Behavioral Health Care, Developmental Disabilities and Hospitals Department, all getting a combined uh, uh, 24 new staff, um, an expected new expense of about 7.3 million, the current program, uh, is about 2.6 million and has 11 staff. The, the Office of Cannabis Regulation component, uh, the direct expense is about 13 FTEs and about 3.6 million. On the local distribution, that 15% um, is divided even further. All communities get a small amount. Um, uh, they all, communities also share based on the volume of sales in their community and then by license type. So um, three different methods for distribution. Uh, Five-year projections um, on the gross uh, <laughs> revenues from this, and you can see where I got the average 18 general revenue impact on this top row, and then the regulatory expenses and the local uh, share is shown here, um, approaching $5 million. Um, how does the program compare depending on whether you're a medical patient or an adult use consumer? Um, there's no referral needed for an adult use consumer. A medical patient would enter the system um, with a copay, a referral, some, some, some way to get into the system, possibly pay for a registry card. Maybe they have an um, authorized caregiver. Uh, this varies depending on the patient, whether they're disabled. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the taxes, um, currently 11% would go to 14%, roughly, under the governor's proposal. On the adult side, 20%. Patients uh, currently are allowed to have uh, 12 plants, and the caregiver has up to 24. Under the Article 11, an adult use consumer would not have a grow allowance, uh, and there would be uh, possession limits. Uh, one percent, uh, excuse me, one ounce or five ounces secured at home, and then uh, more if there's two or more adults in the home. So on the medical side, we'll just quickly um, review a couple of items of interest. I, I mentioned a brief history earlier. We've got a little more detail on these two slides, um, but one thing I'll note uh, is the uh, in 2018, out-of-state cardholders were able to begin using compassion centers. There was also a change in the license fee. Uh, and then in 2019, the authorization for the number of compassion centers changed. That's when you went from three to nine, as I mentioned earlier. Five of those six new um, licenses have been awarded, but they're not yet operational. Um, there are the, There's both participants and industries in the medical marijuana um, industry right now. And in terms of participation, we've been trying to track over the years uh, patients versus cardholders or caregivers. Um, you'll note in the last couple of years there's been an uptick in 
um, other card holders, so that would be out-of-state card holders. Um, and you can see that um, there's been quite an addition to that in the last couple of years. As I mentioned, that that was recently allowed. Um, the some states have fewer requirements and lower barriers to entry, uh, so uh, a medical card holder from another state is is not difficult to get. Uh, how does the state uh, revenue come from medical marijuana? In addition to the fees, the license fees, and the tag sales, and all of the the costs associated with participation, um, those go into a restricted account. Excess funds go to the state at the end, but there's also the surcharges and the sales tax. So we've shown here for you a recent history of those. Last year, the state collected almost $11 million from that. We're on track to collect um, less than 21, but more than fiscal 20. Um, in terms of other proposals you've seen, because you've basically seen this one, um, you saw it last year with a, with a little bit on expungement this year. Um, You've seen versions of this a couple of years prior. Um, you may remember that there was a budget proposal to do a state-run system, um, like a, say, like a New Hampshire um, liquor store type style. Um, but the other proposal that's uh, now active is 7593, which is also on tonight's agenda, and that is one that has governance by a, a newly established uh, cannabis commission and would have adult use retail by compassion centers beginning as early as October 1st, 2022. These next three slides just try to show you how that bill, 7593, differs on some major issues from Article 11, which we just went through in some detail. So in the regulatory structure, as I said, it establishes a new commission with a different um, head structure, not specify the number of staff. Um, it changes the licensing fees and enumerates them in the law. Uh, there's many fewer retailers under the, the 7593, as shown here, and they have uh, reserved uh, licenses for certain groups. Um, there is a 19-member advisory board. The tax system is different. Uh, in the sense that the um, there's just the 10% retail excise and 3% to the local hosting, uh, a total of 20, similar to the governor, but a different way. Uh, dissimilar from the governor, there's no additional charge on medical. Um, and the 7593 has license fees and penalties uh, to help support um, equity issues, financial and technical support to equity applicants. There's no allowance for uh, local impact fees under 7593, as I mentioned, the governor allows for a one time in his proposal. There are possession limits, but 7593 does allow for home grow. Uh, as I mentioned, the governor has total uh, prohibition on public use. 7593 has prohibitions consistent with tobacco use. Uh, expungement is dealt with differently in 7593, allowing it to be free for those previously incarcerated upon request and also not allowing any um, expungement to affect future sentencing. Governor's budget also has a 10% charge uh, for having to handle cash on, um, on a lot of its uh, activity. There's no cash sur surcharge in uh, 7593 and the sales date uh, for the governor's budget assumes April 1st, 2023. We also noted other less significant but um, interesting change differences uh, among the two, and we've listed them in the following two slides uh, just for your review, different limitations in one versus the other. Um, and I, I, one thing, uh, because I brought it up earlier, is that 7593 doesn't uh, makes an out-of-state cardholder present an alternate ID to prove that that out-of-state cardholder sort of got that card from living in that other state as opposed to um, Rhode Island. 
And so those are the major changes there. And, and as we wrap up our review, um, as we told you last year, there's uh, obviously any number of areas that you, and issues that come up when you consider a bill like this, um, in addition to the taxes and revenues, um, how it's operated, how the markets um, operate once, uh, once the new adult use program starts, what are the effects on the medical market, how can it be integrated? What are some of the criminal justice and enforcement issues? Housing, employment, housing, uh, excuse me, equity. Uh, so a number of these are touched upon in either or both bills, uh, but they're all issues that states have grappled with as they've tried to craft programs that work for them. So um, we're happy to try and answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon, for another thorough review. Are there any questions of Sharon uh, at this particular moment from anyone on the panel before we go to the administration? Okay. Uh, oh, you, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman Vella, welcome, some, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sharon, is has the governor proposed any percentage of the proceeds to go towards cannabis rehab centers? Mm -hmm. Specifically, rehab centers. No, there's a uh, the there is a that I'm aware of rehab centers. No, but there is a provision for funding for Buddha on the substance abuse side. Do you know what percentage he's looking at putting into that? And I'll tell you my concern because Rhode Island historically has been really cheap when it's come to things like putting money into the tobacco cessation or Gamblers Anonymous and just push that responsibility off on outside vendors. And I just want to make sure that we're not doing that this time. Well, there's not a specific percentage carve out. I mean, you can see that the funding for the human service agencies, for example, uh, total uh, less than $2 million. That's about 25% of the 25% on the regulatory expense side. But if you're asking, is there a carve out percent for treatment exactly? No, it's envisioned to be supported, but not the way you're describing. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, any other questions of the uh, panelists there? Okay, I think you're done. Um, so at this point now, who from the uh, administration is there? Is it Ms. Uh -huh. Tanner? Okay, great. Uh, okay. If you would, when you get there, just simply um, have your staff identify, I, I guess so your staff uh, identify yourself with your team. Uh, welcome to House Finance, and the show is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, my name is Matt McCabe. I am Chief Analyst at Office of Management and Budget. Um, I'm being joined by Liz Tanner, Director of DBR, and Matt Santa Cruz, Chief of the Office of Cannabis Regulation. We also have Anna Novais here from EOHHS uh, also answer questions as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Director Tanner for some opening remarks. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, we'll be giving our testimony for both Article 11 as well as um, the House bill. And um, on behalf of the department, I'd like to first thank you for the opportunity to comment on this important legislation, as well as support for both the governor's adult use budget article and the, um, the bill will have comments on both. <clears throat> I'd also like to applaud Vice Chairman Slater, House leadership and the staff for their hard work on this issue. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to pull all this information together. And so thanks to their efforts, Rhode Island is closer to legalizing marijuana for adult use than ever before. And we're honored to have the chance to share our perspective today. Special thanks as well to um, House Fiscal Advisor Reynolds Furland and her team for their thorough and detailed analysis and continued partnership with DBR. Uh, Matt and I will briefly summarize the governor's budget article before a discussion of key similarities and differences between the article and House Bill 7593. Um, if you can go to the presentation, does everybody have a copy of that? So we'll start on slide two. So the governor's proposal rests on the following guiding principles. Uh, adult use retailers will be tightly regulated and privately run uh, with intentional incorporation of principles of equity throughout the bill. Our tax structure will be competitive with neighboring states and share a substantial chunk of revenue with local governments. It maintains local control 
and it offers a strong emphasis on public health and safety by sharing resources with the state health and law enforcement agencies while prohibiting consumption among minors through a strong regulatory approach. Matt? Great, and uh, thank you, Director, and thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, we're going to touch on a couple of just sort of quick highlights of the governor's budget article. Obviously, Sharon has done an amazing job of summarizing that for, um, for you all, and then uh, move to a, a couple of comments on, on both um, uh, Vice Chairman Slater's bill um, as, it, as it compares to the governor's budget. Um, so on slide three, moving forward, um, as you know and as Sharon discussed, um, the governor's proposal anchors really strongly on a three-year controlled rollout of adult use retail licenses, and the schedule of that is on this slide before you. Um, the theory behind that was essentially that we cannot really perfectly predict how many adult use retail licenses the Rhode Island market is ultimately going to bear. It's a function of many things, both within and um, outside of our control. Um, but based on the other experience of other states, um, including Massachusetts, we, we believe that a controlled three-step annual rollout of 25 licenses per year for each of the first three years of the program will give us clear signals on the market and clear data and better data on the market conditions and supply and demand um, while safeguarding public health and safety and allowing us to take this in a stepwise fashion. Um, and, and also, as Sharon mentioned, um, these new retail licenses are in addition to the nine um, either currently existing or soon to be existing compassion centers. And to the extent that we get applications in any given year above the number of licenses available, we'll issue those licenses by way of a random lottery, similar to what we did with the, um, with the compassion centers last year. Um, one other thing to highlight just on the licensing framework is that we, um, uh, and the governor's proposal uh, strongly emphasize equitable access to the industry, and there's a couple of different ways we try to get at that. Um, so first, as you see here, the new retail storefronts obviously represent the most significant economic opportunity for entrepreneurs and business owners that have been traditionally excluded from the legal cannabis market. And we directly address this by setting aside 20%, um, which is to say five out of 25, of the annually awarded retail licenses for um, qualifying min minority um, or women-owned business enterprises, um, which is a proportion that's roughly in line with the proportion of non-white um, residents of, of Rhode Island. And then importantly, it's, um, uh, it's useful to point out that these additional sort of ancillary supporting licenses, that is to say manufacturing, processing, transportation, or like extremely small-scale craft cultivation, um, the proposal sets aside half of those licenses for um, minority or women-owned business applicants as well under the theory that these are less capital intensive but still important um, avenues into the market and into the industry. So to move on um, to the next slide, it's important to say that there's a lot of alignment between Article 11 and the House bill before you today. Um, in several important respects worth mentioning. Um, and we've sort of laid this out in more detail in the letter that's been submitted to the committee as well, so I'll obviously um, rely on that for any further backup. Um, in, to start out with, um, both bills seek to create an inclusive and diverse and ultimately equitable cannabis industry in Rhode Island through the licensing set-asides that I just mentioned. Um, uh, for underrepresented populations, um, and that includes uh, communities and groups that have traditionally been um, disproportionately impacted by cannabis-related law enforcement. More to say on that in a minute. Um, really importantly, both bills recognize the um, capacity that exists among our current group of licensed cultivators um, and the strength and the sufficiency of the c production capacity that they represent. Um, so both bills extend the current moratorium on new cultivation licenses for a significant period of time. Both bills very clearly value the role of local governments in setting the rules of the road. Um, cities and towns are afforded, in both cases, ample opportunity to opt out um, of hosting cannabis licensees through a ballot referendum and then through um, revenue sharing um, uh, uh, programs that are um, different in some respects, but ultimately seek to achieve the same goal. Um, and then finally, both bills allow for the expungement of past marijuana convictions, uh, marijuana possession convictions, 
Um, as I said earlier, this is important recognition of the disproportionate impact of um, historic law enforcement actions um, related to cannabis that have disproportionately impacted certain demographic groups and ultimately aligns the state's criminal justice policy with the reality of legal adult use recreational marijuana. Um, having noted that alignment, which is substantial um, and, and, and highly significant, the administration does have a few concerns with, um, with the, the proposal before you today. And these fall in kind of three main um, domains. And as I said a minute ago, the letter that we've submitted to the committee gets into more detail on each of these. Um, the first area of concern has to do with the administrative structure. Um, as Sharon noted, the um, creation of a Cannabis Control Commission um, is significant in, in as much as it would um, absorb the large um, majority of the regulatory licensing and enforcement duties um, of the current DBR, DEM, Department of Health and Public Safety structure and to some extent the Revenue Department. Um, and as it's before you today, the administrative structure contemplated in this legislation is, is complex um, and may raise some implementation issues down the road. I think we all agree that an expedient and, um, and, and transparent and efficient implementation of this program um, is, is a shared goal. Um, and so there may be ways that we can um, work on sort of removing duplicative functions, duplicative reporting lines between the DBR and the Cannabis Control Commission, and ultimately set the Cannabis Control Commission up for success, which is, I think, something that, um, that we all agree ought to be pursued. Um, and then finally, um, as, as I'm sure you know, um, there are some concerns related to the separation of powers provisions of the Rhode Island Constitution that the Governor's Executive Council has, um, has raised and has submitted um, an additional and supporting testimony that you, that you have before you today. The second area has to do with the transitionary period contemplated in the legislation. Um, there's, a, I think, an appropriately aggressive timeline set out um, in the House bill that would require DBR to issue transitionary uh, regulations or transitional regulations to set up the existing compassion centers to very quickly pivot into adult use retail beginning this fall. That's a laudable goal and a very sensible one and, and one that's also reflected in the governor's budget. Um, we have the point of view that um, calling these transitional regulations may complicate matters in the near term um, and that the legislation ought to just lay out a series of very discreet and immediately actionable steps for the DBR to take such that these, um, uh, these compassion centers are able to uh, very quickly pivot into the adult use market on the timeline that's contemplated, which we think makes sense. Um, and so uh, streamlining the statute and removing the sort of transitional reg provision may ultimately facilitate that process um, in a more expedient fashion. And then finally, um, having to do with deference to the Cannabis Control Commission, um, there are a number of relatively <laughs> prescriptive provisions of this bill um, that uh, the administration feels ought to actually be left um, as policy and regulatory decisions to the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, things like you know packaging and labeling, some of the stuff that was laid out in Sharon's slides um, a couple of minutes ago are ultimately like important but meaningful regulatory and policy decisions that may, um, if the statute is, is too prescriptive and is too kind of specific on these points, ultimately hamstring the Cannabis Control Commission in the long term or even in the short term as they pivot into their sort of regulatory and enforcement duties. And so it's our point of view that um, these policy decisions ought to be afforded to the Cannabis Control Commission in their rulemaking authority. Um, and that the statute ought to lay out sort of at a high level what the policy goals are of the, of the, um, of the state. Um, things around public health, public safety, um, uh, setting the rules of the road for the industry and then ultimately give um, sufficient authority to the Cannabis Control Commission to execute on those by way of regulations. And I'll just offer, offer some concluding rem remarks. Uh, without question, momentum and progress towards legalization of adult use marijuana continues to build in Rhode Island. And as stated in the preceding remarks, there exists a large degree of consensus on a number of important components of this issue. And just as importantly, on an approach that emphasizes public health, 
public safety, and a vital and competitive industry for Rhode Island's businesses and consumers. We sincerely thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss this critically important legislation, and we stand ready to participate in any future discussions on this or related legislation, and would be grateful for the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Director. I appreciate that. Um, I've got just one question, I, I think, uh, and it's, it's relative to your presentation on page five of the slide that you have, and it's more of a governance uh, question because it's one I get already from uh, my city, and I'm sure other cities do too. Uh, is it your understanding that the opt-in and opt-out option, is, it's, that's a function of the city, but is that the function of like a city or a town council, or can there be any other organization or governance body in that city or town that can make that decision for the city? So in, in, both, um, in both bills before you today, um, the mechanism fundamentally is a ballot referendum in this year's general election. Obviously, every town's charter is different in as much as the, you know, how you get to it, having it, that question on the ballot. Um, but um, in both cases, the, um, you know, generically speaking, a city or town council would pass a resolution, place the question on the ballot, in a sufficiently timely fashion relative to the you know Secretary of State's deadlines and whatnot, and then the voters this November eighth um, would come to the ballot um, and have the opportunity to opt out. Correct. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to make sure that I understand it the same way that you understand it. That's right. Um, because each city and town has <clears throat> several mechanisms by which they govern themselves. Yeah. Uh, now, if a city or a town decides to opt out, say in the the elections that are coming up, and then they get, you know, six months down the line or a year or two down the line and go, hmm, that wasn't a bad uh, issue. They, they would have to go through the same process to opt back in? You know, it's a little bit of an open question. Um, I think that as I read both bills, it's, it's a one-shot deal. And if they don't do that by this November, um, whatever action they do or do not take by this November 8th, is is the is the go forward sort of steady state um, i'm happy to be corrected about that if i have misunderstood that um, and then obviously that's a subject of the that will be you know subject to the general laws which could always be changed in a future session okay i just want to make again make sure i understand yeah. how that works because that it's critical to know how you can opt back in yeah. after you've opted out yeah. uh, and which bodies within each local jurisdiction, and, and I, I agree with you, I think it's a referendum, whatever yeah. way that is set up as a way to do it, but yep. uh, this could happen. And uh, if, if, it's, if we're not sure of it, we need to get as close to being sure as we possibly can so that we can advise yep. uh, the, the city councils and town councils uh, and the governing bodies that, uh, that ask us questions. Okay, thank you for your, your, your answers. Uh, is, are there any other questions of the panelists up there now? at this point. Oh, Rep. O'Brien. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to be recognized as present and uh, holding the bill for further studies. So. Do you have that, Mr. Clerk? Okay, Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Rep. Uh, Chairwoman Bella Wilkinson, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a question with regards to the public safety portion as it pertains to slide five where you're talking about the values of local government and setting the rules of the road. And if I'm asking the wrong folks, you'll just direct me to who I should wait for, okay? So I was wondering what, if any, discussion did you have regarding certifications of drug recognition evaluators? Because right now, I guess approximately 1% of law enforcement officers do have the certification. It takes approximately 80 hours. I know in the state of Florida, I think um, the field sobriety, sobriety portion of it is 16 hours by itself, and it has to be done in the field with a certified officer. Did you look at having someone from the state police go through uh, and I don't even know if this is available, a train the trainer so that we're not having the burden on all of the municipalities that opt in to have to send a certain portion of their uh, law enforcement of officers out of state 
for a total of 80 hours, and then the per diem cost that's related even on top of the cost of the training. What is the state doing to try to take that burden from the municipalities, or at least help them with it? So it's a great question, um, and, and what you'll see before you by way of the expenditure side, um, uh, allocation of tax revenues and fee revenues contemplates sort of a two-pronged approach to this that allocates money to both the state police and local governments for um, for several different sort of like buckets of services and grants. The largest one of which has to do with training both state and local law enforcement um, on the drug recognition front. I think we heard from both um, state police leadership as well as from some of our partners in local law enforcement that that's a real need, as you point out. Um, and so to the extent that obviously in a small state like ours, the state police and the Department of Public Safety play a significant role in coordinating and supporting the efforts of local law enforcement. We thought that that was an important investment to make on both sides of that equation, if you will. Um, it's important to note as well that you know drug recognition when it comes to cannabis generally is rapidly evolving. And so it's important that these investments, just in terms of the science and what is and is not um, admissible in a criminal proceeding, um, that's a very rapidly evolving legal question as well as a scientific one. And so it's important that we obviously equip the state and local law enforcement agencies at the outset of this to have sufficient, not only funds, but human resources to follow that science closely and ensure that um, what's happening ultimately uh, with the boots on the ground is, is, uh, is in alignment with best practices. So I'm hearing you say that there is a bucket of money for the training. My concern is if we're waiting for an accrual of um, revenue in order to fund this training, we're putting our law enforcement officers behind the power curve. I believe they should be trained before they're faced with the first uh, group of uh, potential individuals who are driving under the influence. And especially, I haven't heard anything about a curbside test. I don't think there is one yet, is there? This is an area where the science is very quickly evolving. And yeah. it, as I said earlier, um, uh, there's like a very like engaged legal debate happening right now that I'm not very qualified to speak to around what is, is and is not admissible, constitutionally speaking, um, in a criminal proceeding with result to a cannabis roadside test. Um, I'm certain that in five or 10 years, that will be fully nailed down by both law enforcement experts, scientists, and the courts. Um, the best we can do right now is equip um, local like law enforcement and state law enforcement agencies to, to do this drug recognition um, evaluation, which is not a roadside saliva test or blood test or mm -hmm. breath test. It's more like recognizing person to person the signs of cannabis impairment um, and adding that fact pattern into an impaired driving um, proceeding um, is something that is happening right now. We have a you know, not insignificant number of cannabis users in this state at present. And so this is a nice opportunity with this new revenue source to invest in bolstering capacity, state and local law enforcement on that front. So again, what I'm hearing is the funding for that certification is going to come after the fact, correct? No, to clarify, we assume all the expenditures for, for regulatory purposes, be it at DBR or DPS, will be available up front on day one. Um, and we do allocate basically half a million dollars for local grant funding from DPS that could be provided for this purpose to local police departments. So when would the municipalities have an opportunity to access that grant money to start sending some of their law enforcement officers for the certification and training? I mean, I assume there probably needs some need for DPS to create a structure around this grant program, so it probably wouldn't happen on July 1st, but it could probably could happen fairly quickly after the budget is, is, is enacted. And my final question is, do we know um, if there's going to be any type of an insurance, uh, a, a motor vehicle insurance impact with us uh, if, if the state decides to go forward with um, recreational use cannabis? We don't know with certainty. Um, it's, it's likely that 
insurers have looked at what has happened in other states and um, made some sort of premium, premium adjustment at the state level or at the group level to reflect um, the implementation of adult use marijuana. We can get back to you with that question, um, with, a, with a closer answer to that question. Um, I would just reiterate the previous statement that there are at present a highly non-insignificant number of cannabis users in Rhode Island, be it on the medical market or the non-regulated market. And so the marginal increase in impaired driving um, is, is, is to be determined, frankly, in, a, in an adult use context. I don't, I'm not trying to be difficult, and I don't, I don't mean to sound critical, but it just seems that there's an awful lot of detail with regards to what the tax rate is going to be per ounce of the cannabis, and then in asking questions, follow-on questions, about how the legalization of uh, adult-use cannabis would have on the quality of life of our residents, I'm hearing, well, we don't know that yet. We've got to figure it out. We, you know, I mean, this this has been on the drawing board for quite some time now. I don't know why we don't have those questions should have been anticipated, why we don't have more solid answers in those arenas. So I can add that we, at DBR, we do oversee the insurance industry market, so we'll make some inquiries because we know that there's been some national studies based on the other states that have gone through this before. So we'll get some information. We'll get that back to you. Thank you. I, I would need that information before I could make a determination how I would vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quite welcome. Uh, Vice Chair Slater. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you all for being here today and uh, going through your, um, your article that you had in the governor's budget. Um, one of the first questions I have is, why a lottery again? And why the lottery in the, in the past time that you did? What was the reasoning behind that? So the, um, the, the core and I think most fundamental and important reason of, of, that, um, of that decision and of that process was to, as strange as this may sound, take our hands off the, off the switches when it came to who does and does not receive a very valuable license in a limited license state like Rhode Island. Um, we have, as you know, done a lot of work in the, in the medical context to make sure that um, applications that were entered into the lottery were qualified and met the conditions of the rules and the regulations, and then worked very hard and did our best to set up a transparent and accountable and, um, as I'm sure you know, highly public process to um, pick uh, five and soon to be six winners out of that pool of qualified applicants. Um, in our minds, that was the way that, um, uh, you know, we could most closely guard against any undue um, sort of outside influence from the industry, from, um, you know, other interested parties, and, uh, and, and we stand by that. So that would be the, the rationale both for what we did do and, and, um, and what the governor's budget article does contemplate. So when the six new licenses, right, that have been issued, you, you vetted those, right? Yes. How many of those have zoning in place? Um, so and how many will be up and what's the deadline for those to be up and running? So as you know, the five that were selected um, on October 29th have a nine month timeline pursuant to the regulations to meet the prerequisites for licensure. Um, the regulations um, required that they have either full final zoning approval from the municipality that they were in or have applied for um, a special use permit or whatever the necessary variants were. So one of the things that they need to do in that nine month period that they're currently about halfway through is receive um, final zoning approval from the municipality that they were, that they're in. To your question specifically, um, I believe out of the five that were selected, three were on a path to having full zoning approval. That is to say that had applied for local zoning um, at the time of the lottery, two had already received it or in a location that, were by, that was by right. So, so two out of the, uh, so there's five that been awarded right now. One's held up, one's held up, right? And then there's five that been, but only two have zoning. So we, we might not, so my issue with the lottery, right, is that it doesn't seem fair to me what, ha what has happened because there's people that put thousands of dollars into these applications for Island residents that were cultivators and that have put their, heart and soul into this program, right? And 
we changed all of a sudden before we were the number one thing that I heard when I when I met and it wasn't you it was a previous uh, cannabis star that was over there said the number one priority would be location and zoning and then we did a lottery and we allowed people that maybe applied for zoning right and people put thousands of dollars into these applications and now we might have folks that don't get this zoning and they were in those 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 places those zones right what are we going to do if they don't meet that nine month are we going to allow them to move we're going to allow them to or are we going to go back to the existing folks that would put the money into those applications and allow them to apply for those licenses do we have any sort of pathway out of it? So as, as I said earlier, we're about halfway through that nine month period and we are, as you know, staying in like very close contact with each of the five <laughs> selected applicants. Um, in the event that an applicant that was selected in the lottery, um, either on the zoning front or on a completely different front, there might be a financial issue, there might be a totally unrelated <laughs> compliance issue, either falls out of compliance with the regulations fails to meet the very detailed prerequisites for final licensure over the course of that nine month period, the department is fully ready to explore alternative paths to making sure that there is a open and operational comp uh, compassion center in each of the six zones in compliance with the regulations. So um, absolutely, there would be a discussion to be had about, um, about uh, in the event, which again, we're not at this point in any zone, um, but should that event come to pass, we'd be very um, hard at work to identify a path to um, an alternative selection. So, so just to get, uh, this is why I want to understand my question, because it gets at the heart of the two bills, right? Because the article basically says that we'll do another lottery to award um, compassion centers. And my bill leaves it up to the Cannabis Control Commission, which would have an advisory board advising them. And my problem is, is that I think that what we did with this lottery is we set people up, you know, to apply and to go through this process. And then we awarded a lot of licenses that won't be in the place to be able to up and run, and up and running. And we've heard for years that this has been, you know, we have three senates, it's a monopoly. I've been hearing that for years. We move forward and it's delayed, delayed, even, even any. So my concern is that I think one thing that we need to do is look at um, some merit-based system of, of awarding these licenses and not be fearful of what happened in other states, but have a merit-based system where applications are graded, whether they be, they have the proper location and, uh, and, and, and vet them that way. I think it's important to try to, try to include and I know that we've heard. Um, I know, I know that we've heard from legal counsel recently from the governor's office about the structure of the Cannabis Control Commission and how they might feel. But the JNC, the Judicial, Judicial Nominating Commission, has done in the same way, and so is the I-95 Commission. So I would say that if uh, this is not constitutional, then those commissions would be following the same guidelines of what, the way the, this commission would be appointed. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's any answer to that. But. Just that I do believe that Claire Richards, the governor's legal counsel, she submitted a letter, and I think she does address that exact question. Yeah. I don't have that in front of me to answer, but um, in the letter she submitted today, I think she provides that information to you. Okay. Um, all right, well, um, thank you. I mean, I appreciate your efforts on this. I think, you know, I've been working on this for 10 years, so I have my bill that I'm gonna describe, I guess, even though Sharon did a great job of it, but I can go through <laughs> my reasons why I've been supporting legalization of cannabis for, for a number of years. I just think it's the best public policy. And uh, you know, when we talk, about, we talk about issues within Rhode Island, listen, we have a robust medical, we have a robust medical uh, program, and we have many people and we have, if you've seen the map that Sharon put in, we're kind of an island of prohibition right now. We're surrounded by legal cannabis around us. So the issues that we might be dealing with, we're already dealing with. So we might as well take the revenue in if we wanna, if we wanna as a finance committee, discuss how we use that money and how we direct it, whether it be DREs or other efforts. I think that's us as a body to take the money in and, and to do that, so thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. And before you take my job, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I know, he's my man. Um, 
uh, before we transition, because he has to introduce uh, his bill himself and say a few words about that before we get into the, the audience. Um, Chair, Chairwoman uh, Diaz has a, uh, a question, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's very short. During um, Sharon's presentation, um, one of the slides referring to the new FTEs that will be adding to different departments. Department of Business and Regulation is the one that has more um, possible f uh, FTEs. And my question is, um, you are in capacity to what you already have, or those new FTEs will do different duty, different, <coughs> different things? I want to know this. So it's a combination of, of those things. Um, it's going to be an addition of, of, of just uh, units to existing areas of work from licensing, inspection. Those are the two big ones. If we have more facilities, we're going to need more people handling licensing, staff applications, ultimately being boots on the ground in these facilities. So that's probably, that's I think two thirds roughly of that, um, of that new personnel addition. The other third is um, relating to things that um, more professional and more mature cannabis regulatory bodies have in place in places like um, Massachusetts, Colorado, more mature adult use markets have some staff focused on data, industry analytics, um, focusing on uh, really deeply integrating with public health data and um, public health officials elsewhere in the executive branch. Um, and then um, some added legal capacity and some added sort of policy um, capacity at a, at a mid-level. So that's kind of where that 13 Thank you. goes. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Rep Nardone, please. Thank you, Matt. One quick question. Um, I'm assuming one license means one retail establishment. Is that correct? That's right. Is uh, that license transferable in any way? At any, can they sell it? To yeah, so there's a process that currently exists in the medical market and would continue to exist in the, um, in the adult use context that um, is laid out both in the statute and our accompanying regulations for a transfer or an assignment of a license. Um, we have relatively frequently changes of ownership come through our office, um, applications for changes of ownership. Um, as I'm sure you know, the um, financial structure of these businesses is in many cases um, complicated. Um, or at least like diverse. And so, um, you know, there are oftentimes shareholders coming in and out, um, expanding or reducing the number or percentage of their ownership um, or the nature of their ownership. And, uh, and so our office is empowered under regulation and statute right now to vet those and then ultimately approve or deny them. Okay, so, so someone can um, sign up, get in this lottery, win the license and then put it up for bid. So in both the medical context and our exist and the proposed adult use context, there would be a one year essentially cooling off period for a new retail license transfer under the theory that we don't want speculative applications like flooding the zone. Um, we want to make sure that the folks that are applying for these licenses are committed to Rhode Island and are committed to operating their business here and are not just essentially coming in to get lucky and then flip the license. Okay, one other question on the, on the licensing framework, the uh, equitable access. Yep. Um, if, if someone wins, gets in the lottery and they, they get a license and then they can have their, their wife go out and she can get in the lottery and she can get the license, they could get, a family could get two licenses, um, would that be acceptable? So uh, the family relationship piece of that in particular presents a unique situation. Um, in very, very, very rare cases, we have had proposals come across our desk for um, spousal, div spousal divestiture, which is to say um, an individual involved with a license at the current moment would like to assign some or all of their ownership stake to a spouse and then theoretically seek an ownership interest in a, in a different license. Um, we evaluate those cases very, very carefully and take a very close look at the legal, essentially as weird as this is to say, the legal structure of the spousal relationship and financial relationships that attach to that. Um, ultimately though, what we seek to avoid at present and would continue to seek to avoid is any um, uh, like a, uh, actual or potential cross ownership interest across multiple licenses. Um, 
because we care about having a, a diverse and accessible market and avoiding consolidation of ownership interests either within families or between otherwise related groups of people. Appreciate it. Rep. Quattro, please. Thank you, Chairman. So um, three other states in New England exempt medical, right, from sales tax. Uh, how much revenue would we be giving up to join them and give medical users a break, seeing as it's by prescription, right, and we don't tax other prescription drugs? Yeah, I believe Sharon's, Sharon's presentation touched upon that. I think it was around $10 million in in um, sales tax and surcharge, commercial center surcharge from, from medical marijuana. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your questions and your answers. I think that exhaust, as I see the, the from the panel, any question. Is there anybody else from the administration? Were you guys it tonight before we move? Okay, great then. Thank you. So you're, you're off the hot seat at the, for, for now. Okay, and I, now I believe uh, uh, Vice Chair Slater is just gonna simply introduce uh, his bill, and then we will go into witness testimony things after that's over. Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, thank you to Sharon actually for a comprehensive uh, analysis of both the governor's article and uh, my bill, and sort of a comparison. So, I appreciate that because I had a whole fact sheet of uh, of. Uh, different things in my bill. But as I look, I mean, I've been working on this issue, as I said, for about 10 years. And I look at the, uh, the crowd that we have here, I see a, very, a lot of familiar faces, people that have been involved in this for many years, people that are relatively new to the issue. But I think um, most people understand what both proposals are, so I don't think I necessarily need to go through um, each and every uh, uh, piece of my bill and, and, and uh, other areas. What I will say, I thank um, Speaker Sakachi and the leadership on the Senate um, and my sponsor, my co-sponsor on the Senate, uh, sponsor on the Senate, Senator Miller. Um, you know, we've worked a lot on this bill. It's been 10 years, as I said, and I put in my own proposals over the years, which um, sometimes have, you know, gotten good receptions, but overall ha have not passed. And I think it's long overdue that the best public health policy is for adults to have um, access to safe, um, regulated uh, recreational cannabis. And um, that's, that's the overwhelming premise that I've been, that I've been operating on for many a years. Um, when we look at, we don't want to really look at what's happened on a national level. We look at a young woman like Brittany Griner now who's detained in Russia for, for like, for a vape cartridge, you know? Which to me is outrageous, right? Like, so when we look at, when we look at cannabis, right? The purpose behind prohibition of cannabis has, has never been to promote the welfare of the people of the United States. This law is exploited to profit, private interests, the expense of people, is fabricated a non-existent problem. So that's the way I look at cannabis right now, is that it's something that we need to, we need to come to uh, resolution and, uh, and allow adults safe access. And I think my bill goes a long way with that. I'm looking forward to the testimony today because like any piece of legislation, it can be improved. And I'm open to improving my legislation. Um, as Sharon went through the history, in 2005, maybe 2006, um, medical cannabis was approved by the state of Rhode Island. I will say in the years of 2006 to 2009, before Compassion Centers and in between there, I think the program sort of thrived and it was done with a lot of patients, a lot of caregivers, a lot of co-ops, and uh, people that really cared about the program, really cared about uh, making sure that uh, medical patients were taken care of. Um, like this bill, similar to the medical program, this will not be the end. Like, whether it be me or other legislators, we'll be revisiting this and there'll be changes. The chairman had a great question about um, local control, and he said, well, in the bill as described, right, like it would be a referendum in November. And whether a town has a referendum, they can opt out. If they don't opt out, um, then as of right now, 
they can't participate in the program. But that could be changed by future legislators. That could be changed the following year if, uh, if legislators allow, just like the medical program. Nothing's perfect. I will say one of the areas that I'd love to improve in this bill and I'm open to hearing on is the expungement provisions. I'm open to, um, I always have been, and sponsored bills on automatic expungement. I know sometimes there's a challenge with the courts and others, but I think that we could get that done, and I know we're gonna hear from a number of people on that. So, and one of the areas, too, that I really think is important is the, um, so back, I wanna say four years ago, we set up a cultivation, uh, a cultivation license. And uh, before that, most of the cultivators were probably operating as co-ops. And they were growing, well, it would be a number of patients. And I disagreed with that. I disagreed with that setup, actually, at the time, because what the cultivation program would do is supply the three existing compassion centers. So I felt like we were setting up folks to get into this license and to create a business and to invest and to support our medical program without the avenue to distribute that cannabis. And um, so in this bill, I give them a moratorium for at least a couple of years and um, to actually gain back a lot of their investment. A lot of folks invested their money, their time, and they've been supporting the medical program. I think they deserve that. So those are some of the premises that I think, I think equity is extremely important in this. I think we set high, high uh, licensing fees in this to fund the equity program and to make sure that we have uh, social equity, whether it be a co-op in each zone and also a social equity applicant. Um, I made sure we put a lot of time and effort into that. I know that there's folks that would like that expanded. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony and I thank everyone for being here and I thank, thank uh, my, my committee members for the support that they've given. But I will, I will set the premise too is that we're surrounded by cannabis anyway, um, whether it be through Connecticut, Massachusetts. So we should have a s structure in Rhode Island, a regulatory structure and a framework um, to make sure we support that. And I did have people that approached me about the medical piece of this, and uh, I'm extremely grateful and thankful to many of the medical patients that have been involved in this program since the beginning. And um, you know, I see Alan Smith out there, and she's gonna testify, I'm sure. But um, I do remember from my first times coming up here when my father, um, um, one of his last legislative acts was uh, having the Compassion Center legislation and overriding the veto. And uh, I met Ellen at that time, and uh, she was very thankful for the program and how it's helped her support herself and her. And, and so I've always remembered that. And um, I'm, I'm open to um, supporting the medical piece, but, but in a way that we might need to tighten up the, uh, tighten up the uh, folks that are in the medical program. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now we're into that third phase that I talked about earlier where uh, it's the most important phase, I think, for us is to hear from you uh, who are there. But please remember the protocol we're trying to use, and I think if we do that, we can get everybody up and get everybody out in a, a, a short period of time. That is, when you come up, if you're testifying on more than one bill, uh, you just say what that is, uh, and then you got three minutes. You'll hear a bell that will go off. Uh, and please, at that point in time, we would ask you to, to begin ending your, uh, your comments so that we can go to the next person. So we'll try and do it that way. Uh, and I think that if we do that, we'll get everybody done. Remember, if you're testifying on more than one bill, just let us know you are for the record, and then we can move on. So with, uh, with the help of Vice Chair Slater here, we'll try to figure out uh, what, what the names are. It's, it's not your fault. Uh, it's my fault for not being able to read your bad writing in some ways. Uh, so I'll take the hit before even we get started. But I'm gonna try and get at least three people up uh, at the same time, uh, and that way we can get going. So. Is that someone and with the middle name of uh, Sabrina? 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 Okay. Okay, here you go. You can give us your real name, because we'll butcher it pretty bad, you know. We want your audience to know, so just come around. Uh, and uh, Ahmad Lucy? Am I? Okay. Oh, who's that? Oh, Alan Smith. 
Ellen. Okay. Ellen. And and then uh, Ellen Smith. Oh, in the university. I know. So yeah. Okay. If, okay. And if you can get another chair, we we'll get Rep. Felix up. She's up. Okay. I think we can have four. All right, welcome everybody as you get settled in. Uh, and you'll have another fourth person that will be sitting uh, right next to you. But you could begin, sir. Just give us your name, uh, you know, why you support it, why you don't, in three minutes, and we'll drive on. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. My name's uh, Jeevan Sobrino Wheeler. I'm the Progressive Governance Director for the Working Families Party here in Rhode Island. <clears throat> We're glad to see uh, cannabis legalization uh, moving forward. Uh, we know that its uh, criminalization of cannabis has disproportionately impacted people of color, working class residents here, and that the funding that's gone towards enforcing criminalization is funding that's not going uh, to education, not going to affordable housing, not going to job training programs. Uh, at the same time that we're moving away from criminalization, it's important to address the impact uh, that uh, cannabis records have and will continue to have for residents uh, unless the legislature does something about it. Uh, and that's why we hope that the final legislation includes state-initiated automatic expungement language, as Representative Slater uh, talked about. Uh, residents can be denied housing, they can be denied uh, employment as a result of a cannabis record, and once uh, it's legal here in Rhode Island uh, and generating profit and generating tax revenue, no one should have to continue to deal with that stigma of a, a cannabis record. Uh, we see the difference that state-initiated uh, automatic expungement m makes versus a petition process that's currently in the bill in the uh, states that ha uh, have currently implemented both strategies. Uh, New Jersey has implemented state-initiated automatic expungement, and they've uh, been able to clear more than 350,000 records uh, in just a year. Uh, Massachusetts, in contrast, um, has gone a petition-based process, and less than 500 residents have successfully cleared the records. Uh, in addition to the uh, benefits it has for residents, it will save time and money for the state uh, doing it all at once, rather than having to deal with thousands of individual petitions. Uh, and it can also be done using an online portal that the state already has for residents to check other types of expungement. Um, we don't need to notify uh, every resi resident individually uh, and by mail, and there's some real privacy concerns with that. Um, to, to conclude, there's a lot of great provisions in this bill, including the, the social equity pieces, the co-op provisions, uh, and we hope to see state-initiated automatic expungement in there to help us more fully celebrate this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, sir. Hello, Chair Abney, Vice Chair Slater. My name is Armin Lucy. I'm president of the Rhode Island Cultivator Industry Association and owner of Evergreen Gardens, LLC, a licensed medical cannabis cultivator. I'm privileged to come before you with the support of a majority of the cultivators re representing all levels of current licensed classes. You have my written testimony, so I'm going to read the names of the cultivators that support this testimony. Myself, my company, Evergreen Gardens, LLC, Warwick. East Coast Cultivation, LLC, Warwick. Cultivating RI, LLC, West Warwick. Full Circle Incorporated, North Kingstown. Mammoth Incorporated, Warwick, Rhode Island. OP Farm, LLC, Cranston. Mother Earth Creations, Inc., Pawtucket. RTG Industries, Inc., doing businesses, Hanks Herbs, Exeter. The Coffee Pot, LLC, Warwick. Bonsai Buds, LLC, Exeter. Gardening for Good, LLC, Pawtucket. Green Med Pros, Inc., Warwick. Liberty, LLC, Pawtucket. Tolaria, LLC, Providence. Canna Farm, Rhode Island, LLC, West Warwick. Mediflor Organics, Inc., Warwick. South County Cultivators, Inc., Bradford. CRI LLC, Hopkinton, High Gardens, Inc., Pawtucket, Deep Green LLC, Warwick, ECCC LLC, doing business as Infinite Bloom, Warwick, Treetop Farms LLC, North Kingstown, Jardins Gardens LLC, Warwick, Natural Green Choice Corporation, Warren, Bayside Growers LLC, Warwick, JBE Industries LLC, doing business as Sweet Spot Farms, Warwick, Salt Palm Additional Pathways, LLC, South Kingstown. Rhode Island Tree Service, Inc., West Warwick. Hino & Company, LLC, Providence. Arctic Green, Inc., West Warwick. Coastal Farms, LLC, Richmond. Firebrand, LLC, North Kingstown. IDBP, LLC, Warwick. Donovan O'Bear, LLC, doing business as Loud, Warwick. And Verde, Incorporated, Central Falls. 
The cultivators have basically two points. I'll, I'll get to them quickly. Um, we're thankful for the two-year moratorium. We request that the two-year moratorium would commence upon the opening of the first social equity retail store, rather than the final issuance of the Commission's rules and regulations. The cultivators have had a very difficult time over the last five years with three compassion centers as our only buyers. So until we have other retail stores other than the compassion centers, we respectfully ask for this change. Regarding the transitional regulations proposed, we request that DBR be granted full authority to promulgate and approve regulations in order to allow retail sales to begin October 1st, 2022. Okay, sir, I, have, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but I have to remind you the Are clock you? has gone okay. off, so. Right. It, in order, confused? we're waiting for, the, to, for the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, it's not gonna happen October 1st, so okay. we thank you. No, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. that that's an interesting way of doing testimony. <laughs> yeah. I've learned something. Okay. Ms. Smith. Yes, hi. Good, good afternoon. Evening, I should say. I, I'm Ellen <laughs> Lennox Smith. I'm, I believe, patient number 99 in the state. I've been a patient here since 2006. And as uh, Representative Scotter sa said, I'm ex uh, Slater said, I'm very grateful. I'm not able to take any medications at all. I'm not able to metabolize, and I have two incurable painful conditions. So. I'm alive here thanks to the state giving me this right. But I'm very concerned that the medical patients um, seem to be left out of this whole discussion. And I just would like to let you think about a couple of things that I hope will get added as an amendment or put into this bill itself. For instance, um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but you get to go into a CVS, purchase your, med your medication at the pharmacy and probably get pretty darn good coverage already. <laughs> Well, that was a quick three minutes. No. Um, <laughs> um, I have to pay for a medical card to technically walk into a, a center to then pay full price for medication that I don't get any reimbursement. So if we're going to let everybody in this state have the, the enjoyment of medical marijuana for pleasure, then, um, I mean regular marijuana for pleasure, then why would the patient still have to pay for a card? And why would I have to pay for the rights of having a caregiver? It just doesn't make any sense, and I think that should be eliminated. Same thing uh, in this bill, it would say that everybody would get to um, grow three plants. Do you understand, I have to pay for every plant and have to get a tag to have the right to grow my medicine that I don't get any money back for? So that doesn't make any sense either. If we're gonna let everybody grow, then please stop forcing the patients to have to pay for tags, it makes no sense. Um, I believe we should return to the doctor-patient relationship is that this time really me? Okay. Um, okay, just quickly, Tourette syndrome, uh, anxiety, schizophrenia, there's a lot of studies out there showing that these are helping people, but yet people are waiting, still waiting for it to be approved in the state. So let's consider going to the patient-doctor relationship in this. It could, simple things that I have sent out to actually every legislator in the state, I will send it again if you need to hear it. There are simple things that could be added to this to protect medical patients as we open this free for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to sit here? Okay, you can share the, the, uh, the mic with the rep. Although we know if you still introduce yourself for uh, the record and uh, your testimony, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Representative Leonella Felix. I d represent District 61 in Pawtucket, which is the neighborhood of Darlington. And I am here in strong support of House Bill 7593. Uh, and first and foremost, I really want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to Representative Slater for his hard work over the years on this legislation and the advocates, who many are sitting right behind us, uh, for their work that they have done on this legislation to make sure that it is equitable for our communities and that addresses a lot of the concerns. And we've heard more concerns that um, obviously need to be addressed, but this is why the process is here to amend the bill and to be able to uh, make it better. And I know that we can together make it better. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, bring up my concern in terms of the um, uh, so-called automatic expungement as it's written, that is not an automatic expungement when you have to ask for it. When you, when the individual holds the onus of having to petition the state to clear their record, then by definition it's definitely not automatic. That is why we are calling for the bill to be amended to include a state-initiated process. Now we're probably going to hear from the courts or attorney generals and 
everyone saying whether or not this can be done, this is going to be cumbersome, la di da there's 11 states that currently have state-initiated um, record clearance processes that are working. For those states that don't have it, then we ha that have petition-based, such as the one that we're trying to implement here, we then have, we see the disparities in terms of folks that have been able to access these records. For example, less than 5% or 6% of people in petition-based uh, record clearance have been able to access their records uh, to be expunged. And I just want to take a second, um, speaking from experience as someone who had a criminal record, who suffered through having to deal with not getting housing, not being able to go to school, without my record being cleared, I probably would not even be here today, right? Because it was an opportunity that opened doors for me. Before my record was, clear, was cleared, um, again, I couldn't go back to school because um, mine wasn't a misdemeanor, mine was a felony, and I just... I was denied, uh, was denied employment, was denied a lot of opportunities, many of which my constituents, my neighbors, and I'm sure many of yours have been denied also. So it's a matter of, again, people have been criminalized by the war on drugs uh, because of the policies that have existed in our countries for so long. And it's time for us to rectify that by doing what is right, and that is making sure we do not put the onus on the individual, but put the onus on the state to ensure that these records are cleared. Again, we can bring experts from everywhere, which we've been working on, on draft language, and I'm happy to present it to the committee. And I really want to make a call out, finally, to the Attorney General's office, to the courts, and anyone who would like to w bring you into the fold to draft this language together. I think together we can get this done effectively. Uh, that works for everyone. So I put that call out because I've been calling and calling and trying to get them to the table, so now I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> you know, one way or another, like, let's work together on getting this done. So I really want to thank you for your time and the opportunity to um, really talk about this bill, because it's really, really important to me and to my community. And I hope that it gets real consideration from you all, because, again, it's important for so many people uh, in this room and those who couldn't be here. So I thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. I, I thought we were on the same team, but you were throwing us under the bus here, young lady. No, thank you, you know? guys. Yeah, yeah. That, it's, out. it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we still love you. Any questions of any of the panelists anybody has? Okay, Signal, thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate your time. Okay, it's, now it's going to get really fun. Uh, is that uh, Verducci? Is that Stephen? Okay, great. Uh, Matt, Senator Crow, did you already? Okay, you, you're done. All right, good. Uh, Lynette Menard, Lynette. Okay, uh, she's not testifying. Okay, she was there. All right, Jeremy Costa. Is that? Okay. Is Jeremy? And Stephen Brown, Steve. And uh, this Cherry Cruz, did I get close? Okay, Cherry, Cherry, got gotcha. you. Cherry. Uh, Cherry, okay. The Fantastic Four. Thank you for, for for hanging in with us. I know it's uh, it's a long night already, but I think we're doing quite well. Uh, we'll begin with you, sir, uh, on the far right. There you go. Uh, hi. Thank you uh, for the time tonight. Um, uh, my name is Steve Viducci. I'm the president of Rhode Island Hemp uh, LLC down in uh, West Greenwich, Rhode Island. Uh, we are in favor of this, uh, this bill. Um, we are requesting a, a minor uh, adjustment. Um, we, we are a fully vertical uh, CBD producer, but we're on the, um, the oil side of the business. So we're asking for a small outdoor grow. Uh, that would allow us to use our distillation process that's already up and running um, and be able to, uh, to uh, supply the new retailers with oils as opposed to flour. Um, we've been working with the DBR for you know, three years now. Uh, we have everything very in order. Um, all of our members uh, have BCI checks. Uh, we would have a plan to put a 24-hour surveillance uh, onto the premises 
and then also work with either a, uh, a local law enforcement retiree to bring them on to consult and or to uh, to control any uh, any pro any issues with the uh, with the outside grow. Um, major thing here is we're not we're not in in this to to hurt any of the cultivators. We're looking to utilize a already capital uh, expenditure of pro uh, of uh, a facility that we already currently run. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Thank Mr. you. Brown. You're up. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Stephen Brown from the ACOU of Rhode Island. Uh, I'm glad that we are almost to the finish line, I think, on this very important issue. Obviously, it raises significant civil liberties issues. Uh, we've presented some preliminary written testimony. We're providing more detailed one uh, testimony. Uh, there are just a few points I want to make that have not been addressed. Uh, first, let me say a couple that have been addressed. We strongly support a strengthened expungement system. Uh, we strongly support addressing medical marijuana issues um, so that there is not this disparate treatment of individuals, a worse treatment for people who are uh, taking cannabis for medical reasons. Um, for other issues that, that have not yet been discussed, I want to very briefly go through um, employment. Um, uh, we, th we have, for a long time, we have said it makes no sense to make cannabis legal uh, and yet bar people from getting a job uh, if they use it. Uh, we think it's really important to have protections for employees. Uh, yes, we recognize that employers also need to make sure they have a drug-free workplace, but they should not be able to surveil their employees 24-7 um, and bar people from a job um, when there's no reason to. Um, second, um, we appreciate a provision in uh, Representative Slater's bill, uh, not in the governor's bill, uh, and we hope it would be in there, I hope it will be in there, uh, dealing with parental rights uh, so that parents don't find themselves losing their children, losing custody of their children because they are reasonably and legally using uh, cannabis. Um, third, uh, one issue not addressed in either bill that recent laws in New York and Connecticut have addressed deal with law enforcement authority and specifically whether the smell, uh, the smell of marijuana is enough sufficient to engage in a search of a car. New York and Connecticut have said no, it is not. The courts in Massachusetts have said the same thing and we think it makes sense to put something in the bill itself so we don't have uh, lengthy litigation over that subject. Finally, uh, the issue of criminal record checks. Both bills have very extensive provisions dealing with criminal record checks for people involved in the business in any sort of way. And I would just note, um, they're very confusing provisions. They're not uniform. Um, they often have the opposite effect of what you want in terms of social justice in barring people from being able to enter the profession because of past records. And we'd urge you to look very carefully at uh, the provisions in both uh, bills to make sure that um, past criminal records do not serve as an unfair and unnecessary barrier for people entering the, this, this new employment. So thank you very much for giving me the time, uh, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Thank you for your time. This, oh, okay. But thank you for your time, because uh, it's important that we hear from your perspective. Yes, sir. Leave, thank leave you, Chairman. Me. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, when you spoke about employment and not being able to surveil employees tw for 24 hours, I'm just confused. What, what did you mean by that? And sure. it relates to, suppose you have a heavy machinery operating company. Are you saying that someone can't require monthly drug tests to ensure that their employees aren't using the substance, period? No. In fact, there are provisions in both bills dealing with safety-sensitive operations. There are federal laws under specific for specific occupations that do require um, more um, uh, strict uh, standards regarding the use of drugs in the workplace or outside the workplace, which is really what we're talking about. Um, but we have heard employers um, uh, lobby and, and ask that bills, the bills be amended to require, uh, to allow uh, drug testing of employees for cannabis. And uh, you're probably aware that uh, the metabolites from ca cannabis stay in one system for three to four weeks. So saying we, were, we are going to engage in drug testing uh, and use that drug test as a basis for deciding whether we will hire somebody or fire somebody is essentially 24-7 surveillance. Um, of their employees, and that is what we, we reject. Uh, you know, again, I don't want to suggest we are saying there, there are absolutely no limits whatsoever 
um, but we do think there need to be strict limits so that there is not essentially a ban on individuals getting jobs merely because they are legally using mar marijuana. Um, employers deal with this right now, not just with alcohol, but with prescription medications, which often can have much more deleterious impact on individuals. Nobody is yelling and screaming, oh, this is terrible. There are people taking lawful prescription medications, you know, but they're, they're working too. Um, I think we need to treat a cannabis the same, again, except for particular positions where there are already federal laws on the books that allow for uh, more, more leeway for employers. And you think the limit should be what federal law imposes for limits on employees, that we shouldn't provide any, any broader of ability for an employer to uh, you know, say, I'd, to I'd draw certainly a red be willing line. to listen to, you know, narrow, other narrow exceptions, um, but what I would strongly object to are broad standards that allow em employers generally to be able to, um, uh, to impose these restrictions. We handled a lawsuit, you may be aware, we actually handled a lawsuit under the medical marijuana law. Um, there was an indiv individual who applied for uh, a paid internship at a fabrics company uh, in Westerly. And when the employer found out that she was a medical marijuana patient, they rescinded the offer of employment. Um, we went to court. Um, we succeeded because there was language, in, there is language in the medical marijuana law that provides protection for individuals. Again, absent a clear reason, you know, an important safety reason, for example, to bar somebody from employment. And we would suggest the same sort of protection should be in, in this legislation as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Cherie Cruz. Um, I'm part of the Yes We Cannabis Coalition um, and a native Rhode Islander. So I want to definitely thank the speaker. I mean, no, I'm sorry, the sponsor and the speaker. How's that? Um, the sponsor and co sponsors and legislators who work diligently, you know, to end the debilitating discriminatory. Um, impact and lifetime barriers for people impacted by the criminal legal system, particularly when it comes to cannabis. Um, and I, I just want to, you know, definitely second and not repeat everything that, you know, Steve Brown has said, especially about, you know, employee rights and, and parental rights, because we know there's parents still losing children today be using medical marijuana and the cost to the state and the impact um, that has on families. So I just, I wanted to underscore that. Um, after he had mentioned that. But definitely I want to get down to the fact that, you know, we want to end this state house to, um, unemployment pipeline, right? And we want to, end, you know, we need a state-initiated automatic expungement um, while opening economic barriers. I mean, and we know for tens of thousands of Rhode Islanders are still who are chained down by the carceral system. I did give a copy of a fact sheet there you have in front of you. And, you know, we did a preliminary look at court data and court records. And, you know, we got close to 40,000 we looked at. We haven't even looked at them all. And you see there's 15,000 Rhode Islanders just with simple possession, and it's termed that in the court records. And over 21,000 with simple possession that have subsequent, meaning they got the charge again and again of these small amounts of cannabis. Um, and, you know, and then there's other charges that are coined, you know, a possession of controlled substance that we haven't even got to the full gamut of that, and there's over 5,000 of those. So we know the impact is going to be great, and why we know the best way to start to repair that harm is through state-initiated automatic expungement. We know our current expungement system is flawed with the petition. I was just there on Friday with a family who has, you know, uh, a marijuana charge on there. Went six months ago to the Newport County Court. The clerk mailed it over. We went over. It's off the court portal, but lo and behold, it's still on the BCI. And yet, what's being done to fix it? This, this mom needs housing in Newport. She needs things, and she can't get it with, with these charges on there. And what did the state say to her? You need to go back and get it but admittedly lost the paperwork after they sent it. So we know this current petition system's flawed. This happens every day. They admit it, it happens every day. So we definitely need to look for better ways to start to address this. And again, thinking about an, a system that could just in one full swoop take care of close to 40,000 people's records and actually get them opportunity employment and housing is just something that this body can do. So if you have any questions, 
other than with the fact sheet in front of you. Um, but I just wanted to kind of highlight some of those things. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate that. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Good. All right. Yeah, my name is uh, Jeremy Costa. I represent um, myself as being a previously incarcerated uh, person. I was incarcerated for one gram of THC oil uh, for almost uh, 123 days with no bond hearing because I had a subsequent offense in the state of Rhode Island in 2003. But um, that's beside the point, not to talk about me, to talk about this great state of Rhode Island and the people of Rhode Island who I want to be able to help represent because there are a lot of those 40,000 people that have been incarcerated, 5,000 for possession with intent. So my discussion is this, and my testimony is this. Um, the Constitution states in Section uh, 5, Article 1, it states that, and, and, and I just want to read it verbatim, it says, entitlement to re re remedies for injury and wrongs right to justice. It says every person within the state ought to find a certain remedy by having recourse to the laws for all injuries or wrongs which may be received in one person's property or character. Every person ought to obtain right and justice freely without purchase, completely and without denial, promptly and without delay. Conformity to the laws, conforming to the laws. Now, my, my interpretation, and I hope it's the same as yours, that when this window of opportunity is opened, it's open to all, that justice is freely given to all, not just those that are specifically, you know, were able to afford a lawyer or were able to mitigate the circumstances in courtroom so they could actually have a misdemeanor and not a felony. The discrimination happens when we start erasing people this is where the discrimination and the racial card starts being pulled and where this Constitution will be utilized when we start creating laws. I am here to defend the people. It says, we the people of this state, which shall make sure grateful of the Almighty God for the civil and religious liberty. We are being civically dead by these rules and these laws. We are civically dead. We need to be able to open those barriers of entry. Number one, we need to be able to deliver the stuff that's coming from these Warwick facilities. We need to, well, wherever they're coming from, we need to be able to have consumption lounges. We need to be able to have the ability to wholesale. The same things that we were supposedly doing where we were wrongfully convicted of felonies, we need to be opened those doors immediately upon the enactment of this bill. And there's a lot of other things that I could go on, you know, but the on-site consumption and the delivery is a must for social equity. Six people getting licenses and all you have to do to be part of social equity is say that I know how to run a business, I've been able to do business and I've been successful at it. Those parameters for social equity, or I'm a minority and, you know, my brother was incarcerated in 1926 and, you know, I, I, I think that I, I, I deserve it because I've been disenfranchised. No. We, the people that have been marginalized need to get social equity. And equity is not giving out six licenses and funding $125,000 to, that's not social equity. About that's another not 30 equity seconds, sir. I'm sorry, okay. but that's okay. that's, I'll, 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 I'll submit my written testimony. I have a lot more to say. Okay, thank you. No, and, and you know, we appreciate that. That's why we have both the written testimony, which we do read, uh, and people express themselves. So thank you. If there's no question of the witnesses, thanks very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, is this uh, Karen uh, Bailu? Karen? Ballou? Karen Ballou? Okay. Okay. Adina. How did you know, Adina? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you heard me gasping on the mic up here. Okay, John Marion. Uh, let's see. Yeah. All right. And I think Liz, you. I, I, oh no, I think she's gone now. I believe she's up on more than one. So we got three. Um, Alan Krinsky. Alan. 
Come on up, please. Okay, we have four coming up wonderful uh, witnesses. You may start, ma'am. Yes. There you go. She's the expert at it. She's got, she's <laughs> got you going. Chair, Representative uh, Slater, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to testify tonight. My name is Karen Ballou. My husband and I are the owners of Cultivating RI. We are a Class A medical facility. Cultivating RI was the fifth license that was issued in the state. However, today there are over 65 licensed cultivators in the state of Rhode Island, and they're all collectively employing over 700 people. I'm here today to testify in support uh, Bill 7593. As business, business owners, I think it's a good bill with only one exception, which is the transitional regs. Uh, my, my concern is the transitional regs. Um, unfortunately, if we have to wait for a commission to be approved, uh, this could uh, be a minimum of 18 months for transitional regs um, to be approved. If that ends up being the case, all 65 cultivators will be unable to sustain being in business. None of the 65 cultivators will survive at that point uh, 18 mon months from now. Um, it's, at that point, it's a race to the bottom. Right now, we're seeing a rapid decline in patients renewing their cards or even applying for new cards. Uh, not only are we seeing the medical market shrink, we are seeing our adult market going over to Massachusetts. What should be happening if Rhode Island was a rec state, we should be pulling in the Massachusetts rec market um, into, the, into, our, into the Rhode Island market. But this isn't the case. The longer we wait, the worse it's going to become. We will have no ability to bring in the mass consumer at that point within 18 months. DBR has started posting on their website their monthly activity with sales and patient cards, and it is very clear that the medical market is moving into Massachusetts along with the adult market. If you look on the DBR website, numbers that are posted, it is very sobering to see the Rhode Island cannabis industry is in trouble. Sales from November, December, and January 2022 are 1.1 million or from last year. Sales from Cultivated to Compassion Center are overall $6.25 million. Sorry, switched. From <laughs> Compassion Center to Cultivated are off 6.25. Um, I'm urging you to please consider allowing DBR to implement transitional regulations and also keep in mind that legal cannabis is safe cannabis. Thank you very much. I, I had not heard that one before, so you learn something every time. Okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, first, I want to thank um, the members and the State House for putting forward the Cannabis Legalization Bill number 7593. I certainly support this bill. My name is Adina Birnbaum. I'm the CEO of Teleria, and we're a woman-owned uh, cannabis cultivator. I'm testifying tonight to express the need for urgency in passing this bill and also quickly passing transitional regulations. As you know, the state of Rhode Island has over 60 small business cultivators employing over 600 uh, people. Many of us have spent over a million dollars setting up our grows. Uh, Rhode Island dispensary sales, as well as cultivator sales to the dispensaries, as Karen said, are significantly down because Rhode Island patients are traveling to Massachusetts. I know small business cultivators who cannot pay their rent, who are closing down grow rooms, who are losing investors and laying off employees. I am personally in the process of selling a piece of my business just to stay afloat. Everyone can see what's happening. Take a trip to one of the many dispensaries that line our borders and you will see all of the Rhode Island license plates in the parking lots. Every day we are losing market share, revenue, jobs, and industry to our Massachusetts neighbor and soon we will see the same thing on our Connecticut border. The business we are losing may never return to Rhode Island. I want to em emphasize that it is imperative that this bill and the trans transitional regulations pass quickly. I believe that the intention of the bill is to have the adult sales start in October of 2022, and I 100% agree with that. 
My concern is that the way that I read the bill is that the transitional regulations must be approved by the Cannabis Commission. I am asking the House to consider a change in the language in order to ensure that legal sales can happen in a timely manner. I'm asking, I'm actually pleading, that you allow the DBR to implement transitional regulations if and only if the Cannabis Commission is delayed for any reason. I'm concerned that we'll be like New York and our legalization efforts will be significantly delayed for months or even possibly years. In New York, the law was passed in March of 2021, and sales are not expected to begin until late 2023 and maybe even 2024. If legal sales take two years to happen, many, if not most, of the small business cultivators in the state will have to lay off their employer, employees and shutter their doors. So please pl pass uh, HB 7593 with any changes necessary to ensure that legal adult use cannabis sales can actually begin on October 1st, 2022, as the bill intends. The survival of my business depends on passing this bill and implementing the transitional regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Sir, go right ahead. Um, thank you very much. No, red is on. Um, good evening. I'm John Marion from Common Cause, Rhode Island. Um, I'm testifying against uh, H 7593, not not Article 11, um, because of the the reasons you heard from uh, alluded to from the testimony uh, from the governor's office regarding the appointment and removal processes for the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, so I just want to very briefly. Um, you know, I, I don't think any of you were elected in 2004, uh, but to take you back in time, you know, the biggest issue in the state of Rhode Island in 2004 was the separation of powers uh, and putting separation of powers into our state constitution. In 2004, 78% of Rhode Island voters chose to do that. They made four changes to the state constitution. Specifically, I wanna point out two of them. One was an amended Article 5 in which we created three separate and distinct branches of government. Uh, and I note that term, separate and distinct. In Article 9, Section 5, which created an appointments clause that was modeled after the federal appointments clause in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, as I show in my written testimony, uh, I start with a quote by uh, the founding father, James Madison, where he uses that term separate and distinct. That is a, a, a essentially, at this point, an ancient term uh, in the separation of powers. I share the history because this bill uh, in creating this commission violates those two provisions of our state constitution, the separation of powers and the appointments clause. And there's ample case law uh, showing that that is true. So we think that uh, if this were to uh, pass as it's written, it would be subject to a challenge uh, and it would not um, survive that challenge. First, it violates the appointments clause because it involves the legislature uh, in uh, the choosing of two of the three uh, members of the Cannabis Control Commission um, by their, the Speaker of the House and the Senate President creating lists of three people from whom uh, the governor has to choose. It also um, uh, encroaches more generally, uh, um, not just on, on the appointments clause, but the, the separation of powers. And you can see uh, in both the governor's testimony and our testimony, references to cases in West Virginia uh, that are fairly contemporary and Florida in which uh, courts um, interpreting constitutional language almost identical to Rhode Island's rejected the use of lists. And then finally, um, we believe it uh, violates the separation of powers because it requires the advice and consent of the Senate to remove uh, any of the three members of this commission. Um, in fact, uh, it was the very first U.S. Congress in 1789 that in the Compromise of 1789 rejected the um, advice and consent requirement for removal of executive officers. So I'll just add, you know, that I'm happy to answer questions, but we really think uh, in order to, if you're gonna create this commission, you need to um, remove those two offending provisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And if you could just shift your microphone over yep. to Alan, and you can go right ahead once you're ready. 
Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Alan Krinsky. I'm a senior fiscal policy analyst with the Economic Progress Institute. Um, we have not taken a position on either piece of legislation. Um, our greatest concern is that if um, if cannabis is legalized for adult rec rec recreational use, it should be done to advance equity and to repair as much as possible the damage done over decades by the war on drugs and the criminalization of cannabis. Uh, and we recognize all the work that's gone into the, the legislation, and we think there are some good equity positions, provisions, especially in the composition of the advisory board, but we think the legislation as is nevertheless falls um, short of what's necessary to address equity concerns. And I just want to raise two points in that regard, one on echoing what's been said on the automatic expungement. Um, in the, I think in the, in the House bill, it's automatic if someone applies, but we need the state-initiated automatic expungement. And then second, I don't know if it's really said, that it's limited, I think, in both pieces of legislation to possession. And I think it needs to be expanded, the expungement. So for example, I heard of a case recently someone um, had a charge or a conviction for delivery for giving a friend some cannabis. Um, that's certainly not, it wasn't selling, let alone trafficking. So there needs to be, I think, an expansion of what's included. And not only that, but, but many times arrests, charges, convictions have ancillary charges, like disorderly conduct, say. Um, and so we would urge that, or resisting arrest, and we would, we would urge that um, with the automatic expungement that it brings in these other sort of associated charges that would otherwise possibly remain on people's records. Um, Second point is on the funding and administration of the Social Equity Assistance Fund. Um, first, we want to make sure that it's adequately funded. My understanding is that the initial licenses would seed it with about a million dollars, um, but none going forward, then application fees would, um, it, and, would, would um, and license fees would fund it to my estimate about a million dollars a year. Um, we heard before that it's going to bring in something like 18, maybe $20 million in revenue eventually. So that's about 5% of the funds. There's no revenue would go to the Social um, Equity Assistance Fund. So I think it's just worth asking if that is an, uh, enough of an amount. Um, and then last of all, connected with that uh, would be the, the decision-making uh, power. We think that people who have been harmed by the the criminalization of cannabis should be involved at every level, employment, ownership, regulation, and oversight of the industry, and in decisions about expenditures. And I think in both pieces of legis legislation, there are advisory boards that can make recommendations, but we don't know for sure, and I, 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 the attention is good, we don't know for sure what will be um, accepted, so we think that, that people who have had really that experience, um, that their views need to be more fully reflected in all dimensions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Alan. Any questions for the panel? No? Nope. So thank you for your testifying. And the next round up would be Rep. Wranglin Vassal, Jeff Pad Padua, Pita Kasabian, and then Jordan Get Day. Inland Rep, you can lead off. The red light means the microphone is on, and you can start testifying. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to extend my gratitude also to Rep Slater Thank you. for uh, putting this um, bill forward. I did not plan to speak, um, so I don't have a fully crafted um, testimony, um, but I do have some notes. and. I thought it was important for me to speak this afternoon, this evening, um, because one, um, over the last three years, I've held several community meetings on this, and Rep Slater, you have joined me in one of those meetings that I can recall. And I've listened to so many men and women who have been harmed by the, <clears throat> the so-called war on weed. And so I wanted to, I'm here today um, to lift up their voices. I'm here to lift up the voice of the young man who testified um, in one of our meetings that he had 30 years probation over his head, and he's like 41 um, at that time. I'm here to lift up the voices of women um, who are in prison right now um, because they might have been carrying um, weed for a loved one or, or whatever. 
I'm also here to lift up the voices of families who were not, were not able to go and visit their kids um, in public housing because the so-called um, war and weed. So um, this is very, very important to my community. It's very important to children, and it's very important to families. I have uh, a, a, one question here that I have in, as it relates to the social equity fund. And I want to know who will be administering that fund. And I also want to know um, how is the, uh, the, the money, is the, the revenue um, from this fund, how is it going to be distributed? So I do know that, um, w just a quick read of the bill, it's going to be going into arts and, and all the rest of that um, for schools. But I do have some recommendation for um, folks that are going to be on the committee. Um, I think, not I think, I know that it's important for the voices of people that have been harmed by um, the so-called war in weed, um, that they should be on those um, commission as well. I think um, we need to have representation from urban schools um, on that as well. And I am also reiterating what has been said, um, and I don't want to be redundant, but I think it's important um, to state this again and again and again, because um, repeti repetition um, means knowledge. Repetition means um, folks are hearing it and learning it. Um, so there should be um, this uh, state should be initiating the expungement and not voluntary expungement. See, this is very, very important. I know so many people personally whose lives have been uh, impacted in a negative way by the so-called war and drugs. And my concern, one of my biggest concern, is that the people that are going to be benefiting the most that are going to be benefiting the, mo benefiting the most are not were not harmed by the so-called war in weed. That is one of my biggest gripes. So I just wanted to lift those voices up and to say when we talk about justice, when we talk about equity, it cannot be mere rhetoric. So I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And to my left, your right, sir, go right ahead. Red light means you're on. Thank you. My name is Jeff Padua. I represent a group of eight cultivators. They've organized uh, a not-for-profit called Sensible Cultivators for Intelligent Reform. We are in favor of 7593. Um, Representative Slater, thank you so much for your work this year and your prior work. Greatly appreciated. Uh, as you heard from Karen Ballou and Adina Birnbaum, and as you'll hear uh, from Peter, who are cultivators, part of our group, they have invested millions of dollars. They, empl they employ dozens and dozens of people, and their businesses are at risk because Massachusetts businesses are advertising on our billboards. People are leaving our state. They're going to buy product in Massachusetts, and the medical market in Rhode Island is falling out. We need this legislation as quickly as we can. You've heard from a number of people testifying tonight that the linchpin to these transitional regulations is the commission approving them. There is a reasonable degree of foreseeability, foreseeability that that commission will not be up and running. We need to have a belt and suspenders approach so if the commission is not up and running, DBR or another procedure is in place to approve these regulations. Without that, we will be losing jobs, we'll be losing businesses, and we can avoid it with some technical amendments to this bill. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time and attention. And thank you for testifying. Sir. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Peter Kasabian from Loud. Loud is a state licensed medical marijuana cultivator located in Warwick, Rhode Island. I am before you tonight to express support in House Bill 7593. Thank you, Rep Slater, for all the hard work you've done on this bill and previous bills before it. Appreciate it very much. We need transitional regulations that will allow sales of recreational marijuana to go into effect immediately. We cannot wait for adult use sales to begin October 1st. 
myself and my fellow cultivators will not make it that far. Cultivators' sales in general are down dramatically, and in some cases 100 percent, to zero dollars in sales in 2022. I made two sales in November of 2021 and one sale in December of 2021. Loud has made its first sale March 22nd of 2022 today. <clears throat> Many, if not all, of my fellow cultivators are in the exact same position. You can imagine how challenging it is to operate a small business and maintain employee jobs, pay rents, purchase supplies, pay for testing, property taxes, insurance, utility bills, etc., with three potential customers in a first quarter of 2022 with no revenue whatsoever. That's challenging. A majority of Rhode Islanders are getting their, they're getting their cannabis from adult use retail stores in bordering cities and towns in Massachusetts. We need this bill voted on and approved expeditiously to save our cannabis industry here in Rhode Island. We need adult use sales to begin immediately with the three existing compassion centers. We cannot wait until October 1st for adult use sales to begin. Again, I appreciate and support House Bill 7593. And thank you again, Rep Slater, for all your hard work. And we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. And if you could just slide the microphone over to Jordan. It's your show. Thank you, Rep, for having my back. Thank you for passing me the mic. Jordan Day, the director of the Rhode Island League of Cities and Towns, interim director of the Rhode Island League of Cities and Towns. I've testified before the committee a dozen times so far this session, it feels like. Just a few things. One, I have to say thank you to Representative Slater for always being um, a helpful person when it comes to dealing with municipal priorities and local control. He's always been a uh, a willing partner in addressing some of our concerns, and I am very appreciative of all the work that he's done with us to hear us out. Um, we're very pleased with the outcome of the bill on House Bill 7593. We're very excited to see the model that has been proposed as far as local control is concerned. We're excited to see the 3 percent revenue rate. We would like to see the addition of public safety grants and impact fees as proposed in the governor's budget. That is just one way to ensure that communities that may not choose to legalize marijuana but have overflow concerns are able to address those things. We see that every day when it comes to illegal off-road vehicles. It can go from Pawtucket to Providence to Cranston in a matter of a minute. Not, hopefully not really, but <laughs> very quickly. And I think that that's a realistic concern for many communities, that they are also going to have to deal with overflow issues. Secondly, in order to continue the consistency with Massachusetts, currently the funds are dispersed quarterly. We would like to see them dispersed on a monthly basis. Lastly, and most importantly, <laughs> um, as I've expressed to, uh, to Representative Slater before, we would like to see council resolution or ordinance authority restored and not have this go to the ballot. Um, we are appreciative of the fact that this is during a general election, and so it's already a budgeted expense for many of our municipalities. So we want to say thank you for that, and if that stays, we would like to see any future elections have to be maintained on a standard election year. We do want to seek further clarification that if a community chooses to opt out right now by November 8th of 2022, that there is also clear opt-in procedure later on, and if it is by voter referendum, that it is also in a general election year. For that, I thank you for your time and am available for any questions. Thank you very much, Jordan. Any questions? Oh, nope. thank you all. And then next up we have Ellen Lennox Smith. She, she testified already. And then, so imagine Stu Smith. Uh, yeah, he wrapped the ballot. And then Mike Shinucci. Anybody that's a Mike that's testifying? And then Daniel Denner. Denver. Jonathan Martin. Mike, if you're a Mike, you can come on up. <laughs> and 
And then Jason. Iannucci. He left? Okay. And then uh, Stuart Proctor. Yeah, come on up. Do a couple minutes. And then Tom Mira. All right, and then, sir, my left, your right. You can start testifying. Red light means you are on. So just make sure the microphone is red light. Yep, so you got to press it until it's Sorry. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> uh, thanks to the chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Daniel Denver. I'm a co-chair of the social justice organization Reclaim Rhode Island. And uh, I want to thank you all for your time today. And I'd particularly like to thank Representative Slater um, for his longtime leadership on criminal justice and drug law reform, and particularly for his work on, on this bill, which I know he's been working on for a very long time, um, this long overdue legalization of cannabis to make sure that it's done the right way in a way that prioritizes racial and economic justice and that rights the wrongs uh, committed by the war on drugs, which you've already heard a lot about today. Um, in particular, a major priority for Reclaim um, is that this bill has take, would take the historic step of making Rhode Island the first state in the country to reserve cannabis retail licenses for worker-owned cooperatives, which is just huge, because that ensures that working class people in Rhode Island, rather than these extremely wealthy big weed companies that dominate markets elsewhere in the country, get a piece of the market. And I think that's extraordinarily important. It's extremely innovative, and it will get a ton of national attention because uh, other states have tried to figure out ways to do this, and this is uh, a really innovative way to try to deal with it. So I really commend Representative Slater on taking the lead for th on that. Um, this legislation, though, as other people have mentioned, um, does fall short in terms of righting the wrongs of the drug war. The current legislation, and other people have talked about this, so I won't belabor it, um, it puts the onus of expunging marijuana-related criminal records on the people who have already been wronged by marijuana prohibition. So we, like others, uh, are asking for the bill to be amended, amended so that cannabis-related criminal records are automatically expunged at the state's initiative. We know from other states that automatic state-initiated expungement will lead to far more criminal records being expunged. If cannabis is legal, just no one should have a scarlet redder, letter on their criminal record for marijuana possession. That seems like a no-brainer. Um, what's more, uh, it will be far more costly for the state to individually process each and every expungement. Um, the currently proposed expungement method um, doesn't do what it needs to do for, it's a bad deal for Rhode Island taxpayers, as well as being unjust to people convicted of possession-related marijuana uh, offenses. We also, though, believe that the legislation should be amended so that any offense that is decriminalized, including sharing marijuana with someone or cultivating a plant, that that should also be eligible for automatic state-initiated expungement. Further, we also would like to see the legislation amended so that anyone with an offense not eligible for automatic expungement should be allowed to petition a court and have their case considered as well, so not automatic in these non non-possession-related offenses, but an uh, opportunity to petition a judge and ask. Thanks for your time and for moving this historic bill forward. We look forward to working with you um, to amend this bill and to ensure that it benefits Rhode Islanders to the greatest extent possible. Thanks very much. And thank you for your testimony. Sir, just make sure the red light is on and you're good to go. So I want to just point out to uh, Rep Slater that uh, 10, 9 years I've lost a bunch more hair, and you've gotten distinguished gray sideburns. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for having, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk. I'm a psychotherapist and convener of What's the Rush, Rhode Island, but today I'm here as a former marketing guy and a concerned taxpayer. I'm not any longer opposed to legalization, since for the most part, it is evidence-based in terms of these presentations. And most importantly, it recognizes the need to control the following universally acknowledged dangers of marijuana. And they are marijuana is addictive, it's damaging to the brains of youth through at least age 25, it's impairing when driving under its influence, 
and black and gray market activity have continued at significant levels in legalized states. However, I cannot support the commercial retail point of purchase model and vision because it is literally giving away the store. I also believe that the commercial model is flawed and destined to fail in managing these dangers. It will inevitably result in our being right back where we were 60 years ago when we were fighting the addiction, the, the addiction sales industry's tobacco marketing processes. I ask, along with the several other questions listed on page two of my testimony, why would we do that? Instead, I respectfully recommend that we shift to a state-run management contract model similar to, for example, the statewide single-service uh, source school food program management contract. Such a contract would only be at the point of retail sales. All other aspects of the program would remain as is. Let's face it, every marketing function's sole mission is to increase demand, use, and market share. Mm -hmm. Clearly, to do this, marijuana marketeers must develop more and more daily to near daily users. Take a look at Exhibit 3 of my testimony. The black past three-month three use curve is what happened in the first two years of legalization in the province of Alberta, Canada, which has a commercial program. Compare it to the red curve from Quebec, which has state-run stores. As of January 1, 2021, two years later, use is up to 21 percent in Al Alberta versus just 10 percent in Quebec. That's a huge difference. Clearly, Quebec is managing use growth and therefore addiction rates and risk of increased impaired driving. Again, from Canada's experience, and note number five shows how difficult it has been to monitor and hold accountable the marketing function of commercial models in four different provinces. Of the 211 firms with online presences studied, 81 percent had at least one violation. And N Note 6 shows that we have similar regulatory adherence problems with four legalized Western states. We have to ask ourselves, why would we want to spend substantial amounts of money and human resources to monitor and control the marketing practices of 30 to 80 commercial entities when a state-run program could effectively regulate just one, ours? My testimony has another dozen questions that grow logically from comparing the benefits of a state-run management contract to the proposed competitive commercial model. One of them essentially asks, why would we pass up the substantial profits and cost of doing business savings to be gained with a state management contracted model? We should explore them in much more detail. In closing, Rhode Island is almost there, but we have to get it right. I respectfully ask that we all take a comprehensive, in-depth look at the state-run management contract model. We've suggested this for the past three years. And as Exhibit 2 indicates, the American Society of Addiction Medicine also recommends and provides well-researched evidence for state-run retail sales. Let's not rush to give the keys to our store away. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then we just move right down the line. Crikey, I don't think I'm quite as well prepared as that fellow. Um, Speak from the heart. Absolutely. So I'm Stuart Proctor. I'm uh, currently the laboratory director at Pure Vita Labs. We're one of the state regulated facilities that are actually doing the um, testing program for the medical uh, medicinal market. Um, speaking to the actual bill, I think, it's, I think it's excellent in the way it tackles certainly the analytical side and the fact that it calls for additional tests of things like mycotoxins and also um, all the edibles that also need to be required tested. But I would say um, in terms of actually the transitional period and how that needs to function, I would also agree with the fellow cultivators that realistically for this to go um, legal at any point, you have to have the infrastructure in place for that to actually happen. Um, and as a lab, I can tell you for, for sure that if it's two years away, um, I do not think that the market in its current state will be able to support the current, current lab facilities to make this product safe. And, was it tested? Was it legal? Cannabis is safe cannabis. Is that, was that the words was used? Um, and I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, the, the further we move away from having these uh, facilities and, and cultivators working as a team, because we are all a team, um, to actually provide market that, that the products it requires, 
Um, the longer we delay and we let this slip to Massachusetts, which actually, I have to say, has some very precarious regulations on testing, um, but I won't get into the technical aspects of that. Um, but we do have the opportunity here to, to actually forge um, a safe market with accurate labels on products, which doesn't exist in Massachusetts uh, right now, quite frankly. Um, and without the sort of this bill going through and actually be regulated and passed through quickly, um, I actually don't think there's going to be the infrastructure in place in a year's time. It, it, will, it will crumble. So it's, it's, it's key that we get things moving quickly, um, just so we actually have this discussion in a year's time and say we can now switch the lights on. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <coughs> it's on so I can start, right? Go right ahead. Hi, my name's Tom Merzer. I'm uh, the president of New Leaf LLC. We're a culti we have a cultivation license. We decided not to cultivate, we just manufacture. We're a processor. We make oils and edibles, and we make drinks. And it's amazing to me that this bill pre prevents drinks. Um, I'm scratching my head on that one. Um, drinks are sold throughout the state of Massachusetts. We sell them in Rhode Island currently. They are the fastest growing segment in the, in the legal cannabis market around the country. And one of the reasons is they're an alternative to alcohol. The other thing about drinks is we can microdose it. If you are looking at expanding into a rec market, you don't want to have consumers stuck with just flour or vape pens, which have higher potencies. You may have an, a person who wants a two milligram product, and the best way to do that is through a drink. Uh, the branding, third party branding components is unusual too. We sell Dell's lemonade to two of the compassion centers in Rhode Island. We also sell uh, the original Italian bakery pizza chips to two of the compassion centers in Rhode Island. We have several other Rhode Island-based businesses who would love to have their products done safely. We use Pura Vita Labs. They come in every time we're ready to, we process, they come in, they test our product. We have to provide certificates of authenticity to the compassion centers, so all safe and regulated. But it drives me crazy for the last, I've been in this for seven years and we're running out of money to go buy billboards that you guys see every day. And we can't advertise in Massachusetts, can't. I'm a lawyer, I think that you have a big First Amendment issue with that. Either stop Massachusetts from advertising in Rhode Island or let Rhode Island businesses do the same. You can't have it both ways. We're supposed to be small and nimble. This needs to get done quickly. You've heard the testimony from all of these other companies. There are statutes around the country and regulations throughout that should allow you, as a body, to put the best of it together and get this industry going. Representative Slater's comments were spot on. I live on the east side of Providence. I can go 10 minutes in six directions and buy weed. I, I, you know, it is what it is. Whether there's the moral issue behind it or not, we are not Kansas or South Dakota, where you have to drive 100 miles in each direction to another state. It is what it is. And the revenue numbers you have are pathetically low. Massachusetts is going to do $2 billion this year. Just do the numbers. Rhode Island has the second highest admitted adult usage rate in the country. At just under 15 percent, Massachusetts is number one. Every year this bill gets delayed, you're looking at 20 to $50 million in tax revenue not being collected for the state of Rhode Island. In the meantime, these businesses are struggling. If you need to expedite the regulations, I work with Matt and his team on a weekly basis. They do a great job. DBR can handle it if they, I hate to give them more work, but they're a fantastic group as far as regulating my business and working with us and interim regulations to get this program going should be a no-brainer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Have a good night. Oh, it looks like we do have a, a question um, for Mike, I believe. The second speaker, the second, what, what is your name, sir? Mike Cerullo. You've Mike Cerullo. 
And Mr. Cerullo, did you provide written testimony this evening? Yes, ma'am, six pages. So that was what you read with, to us today? With, uh, with uh, some exhibits and end notes, detailed Great. end notes. Yeah, I look forward to reading it. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome, ma'am. If you need to call me, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and, all right, and it looks like we're exhausting the witness list, and we have, um, I know I called a couple of names earlier, um, and not everybody came up, but the last person that is on the list that doesn't have an X through it is Carol. You're batting clean up. Elan, anyone else that was on the list that I called that didn't come up? Okay. And then, Caro, once you settle in, just press, make sure the red light is on. That means the microphone is on. And you can rock and roll as soon as you're ready. Good evening. Good evening. Elan, if folks in the witnesses they can quiet down a little bit, beautiful. Yeah. Go right ahead. If you don't mind, since I've been here for four hours and I was one of the first people to sign up and yet the last one to testify, I'd like to read all of my testimony without rushing through it, okay? Is it, is it written testimony that you submitted it's, as well? It's, it's not gonna be that long. My name is Carol Formica and I'm here tonight as a concerned citizen and as an educator. I am not a lobbyist. I am not a CEO or a president of a company. I am here as a voice for our children and our students. I have served on the 2017 Special Legislative Study Commission, which was charged to compile a report on all the effects of mar marijuana legalization. And I emphasize all the effects. But unfortunately and under strange circumstances, it was suspended and then terminated before my colleagues and I were able to present our side of the issue regarding societal impacts. And if I haven't made that clear, I am opposed to H7593 as well as Article 11. I have researched the effects of marijuana legalization for over 10 years, and I have shared my research with the public in form of letters, commentaries, and testimonies. I will not repeat all of those findings tonight, as I have sent all of you copies of my research, including data on youth use, drug driving, workplace safety, black market expansion, et cetera. Instead, I'm here to ask you all a question. Why would you vote to pass this legislation? What good will come from this legislation? I have been told recently that revenue is not a motivation, as there is no money to be made. As a matter of fact, one of the first presenters to the Spe Special Legislative Study Commission was Andrew Freeman, a former director of marijuana coordination in Colorado, who stated, you do not legalize for taxation. It is a myth. You are not going to pave streets. You are not going to pay teachers. The big red herring in the whole thing that the tax revenue will solve a bunch of crises, but it won't. As far as the cost-benefit analysis, a study conducted by the Centennial Institute in November 2018 on the economic and social cost of legalized marijuana found that for every $1 gained in tax revenue, Colorado spent $4.50 to mitigate the effects of legalization. That's a negative ROI of $3.50. Referring to your point, Ms. Vela Wilkins, Wilkinson, sorry. That's putting the cart before the horse. What we do know is number one, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, one in six children who try marijuana become addicted. Number two, in a 2019 Target 12 investigation revealed an uptick of marijuana vapor, vaporizers being used within Rhode Island schools, and that in a four-month period during that school year, four Tollgate students were taken away in a rescue after having an adverse reaction to the drug. Several medical incidents were also reported by Coventry, West Warwick, and Barrington. Number three, in July 2021, the Providence Journal published an article regarding a national study that found young adults who use marijuana were more likely to think about and make plans to kill themselves. In the report, Dr. Nora Valco, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, stated that consumption of marijuana increases your risk of suicidal behaviors. We are currently coming out of a pandemic that has exacerbated the mental health crisis our youth are facing, with the number of children seeking psychiatric care in hospital ERs skyrocketing. Again, I ask you, 
why would you vote to pass this legislation? Voting for this legislation would essentially make you all an accomplice to putting drugs in the hands of our children and our students. Is that what you want your legacy to be? Is this legislation in the best interest for the health and well-being of Rhode Island communities, neighborhoods, and families? Big Tobacco lied to the public about the detriments of smoking tobacco. That's on them. Big Pharma hid the addictive qualities of opioid use. That's on them. But you all know the detriments of marijuana legalization. You have the research and the data at your fingertips. If you pass this legislation, any unintended consequences from this legislation is on you. Can you live with that? That's a question only you can answer. Thank you very much for your testimony, Carol. Pat, go right ahead. Red light means it's on. Uh, Pat Ford, Coalition Radio Network. Uh, just to uh, follow up on a couple of the claims made today, uh, the ship has sailed. Cannabis is available readily virtually in every aspect of Rhode Island society. Um, as one speaker pointed out, I believe it's about a 15% usage rate, one of the highest in the nations. Uh, I, I, I want to talk about California because no one's really talking about the largest implementation of legalized cannabis and its really complete failure at, on, on a large scale. I'm just going to quote very briefly, voters passed a law in 2016 making recreational marijuana legal. Today the vast majority of the market remains underground, about 80 to 90 percent of it according to experts. Because that 2016 law gave municipalities the power to ban weed as they see fit, the majority of cities and counties still don't allow the sale of cannabis, inhibiting the growth of the legal market. In places that do allow it, the limited availability of licenses, expensive regulatory costs have put the legal market out of reach. And many of the people of color who are considered entrepreneurs who were supposed to benefit have actually ended up losing money. Does this sound familiar? Meanwhile, consumers remain confused. The problem is this. Anyone who wants to get cannabis in this state can. They can do so at a market price. The beneficiary of having state-sponsored, if you will, cannabis is that it will be regulated and safe. That's the advantage, and there is a cost trade-off to be had for that. But at the same time, if you're losing 80 to 90 percent of the market because of the confiscatory taxes placed on cannabis by the state, then consumers will simply rebound to the underground market and continue to buy from the relationships they've had in many cases for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And police departments across the state are powerless to do anything. They've never been able to really contain it. It exists everywhere. So legal cannabis is, in fact, safe cannabis. It will at least, given the testing of some of the fine companies who are here today, will prevent, if you will, the, uh, the bastardization of the product. So it's time to understand that the free market will reign despite whatever you want to do here in Rhode Island. And the free market requires a fair price for a clean product, just like any other consumer-driven product, just like the sale of alcohol. If you make it difficult, if you make it inconvenient, if you make it expensive, you will fail. And the private market will continue to supply cannabis at a high level. And in some cases, as the young woman just mentioned, some of it will be dangerous. Regarding the, the sale of medical cannabis, we tax medical cannabis, which is an incredible insult and affront to the citizens of Rhode Island. This program was put into place simply to give folks an efficient, safe, clean, regulated place with dignity to purchase a healing medicine that for many people that I've seen over the years testify, because I've been here a long time, all right, that for many people gave them dignity, in some case in their failing years. As Ellen testified, it is not reimbursed, but the great affront to them is that it is in fact taxed. In the state of Rhode Island, we tax people who are dying. We profit as a state off of people who are dying. We need to stop that. And it's an opportunity right now as we reevaluate all the laws regarding the sale of medical cannabis to remedy that grotesque injustice that's taking place right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. And then Chairman Hull. Uh, I'd like to be reported as present and counted as a yes on all whole votes this evening. Beautiful. Thank you. So you had, the, you had the last word of the night, and it looks like that exhausts all uh, witnesses oh, today. So it. that concludes the hearing on House Finance. Everybody have a good night. <laughs> oh, I made it. Thank you.